Hello? Hi, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, so our first speaker today is Leslie Kelbling from uh, MIT, where she's a computer science professor. Um, Dr. Kelbling received her BA in philosophy and a PhD in computer science, from, both from Stanford University. Um, her research focuses on a broad range of topics, including decision-making under uncertainty, reinforcement learning, um, control, and all of these, particularly in the context of applications to robotics. Um, she's ma made foundational contributions to a large number of areas um, and is per perhaps particularly famous for co-inventing POMDPs, um, partially observable Markov decision processes, which I have a particular affection for because that was one of the first papers I was sent to in grad school. <laughs> um, so it's very exciting for me to be introducing her. Um, Dr. Kelbling also co-founded the Open Access Journal of Machine Learning Research, which I think is a very cool autobiographical note. Um, we're very lucky to have her speaking with us today, and today she's going to give a talk titled, Doing for Our Robots, What Nature Did for Us. Please welcome Dr. Kelbling. Thank you so much for the invitation. This is a great meeting. This is completely not like the meetings I normally go to, so it's really uh, fun and exciting to have a, a different venue. Also, I did not co-invent Pondy Peas. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I did write a, a paper, but um, <laughs> anyway, uh, that's an old idea. Okay, so um, so here we go. Uh, okay. So I work on robots, but I really want to understand intelligence. That's my personal research goal. And the example I like to think about is making tea in any kitchen. I gave this as an assignment to students in my uh, seminar one time, which is just to go to somebody else's house without asking any questions and make tea. So you could all do it, right? And you could poke around and find the tea and figure out how they make the water hot and get a vessel to put it in and so on. And I want to make a robot that can do that. I feel like that's a pretty good short-term stand-in for everything. So robot that can make tea in any kitchen. So what do you need? Well, you have to be kind of pretty flexible, robust, adaptive. You know, maybe you have to build a fire to make the water hot. Um, there's purposefulness. There's a long horizon, relatively, in a problem like that. So OK, so I think of myself as a robot myself, as a robot engineer, as a, as a robot factory. I'm thinking about the following problem. I am going to make some robots. Let's assume that the hardware is fixed. And I want to, I have to figure out what program to put in their head. Fundamentally, that's my job. Find a program to put in the head of the robot. And that program is going to be some mapping from the history of observations and actions that it's ever seen into the next action. That's just what a robot program is. There's no real argument about that, I think. That's what it's got to be. OK, so what program should I put in the head of my robots? And the way I want to think about this problem is to say, well, OK, let's imagine that you come to me and say, Leslie, please make me some robots. You need to tell me something about a distribution over problems they will face. So it could be that you want robots to weld a particular joint in a particular airplane in your factory. OK, that's a very narrow distribution. Or it could be that you want to make robots that are general purpose helpers in the home. And that's a very big distribution. But there's some, let's say, distribution over the problems the robot's supposed to solve. And the idea is that I need to make one program that will go out in the world and solve problems from that big distribution. That's my job as the factory. OK. So the reason that I kind of like to start by laying this framework out is that I think on the one hand, it should remove most of the arguments we have. I don't know about you folks in your field, whether there are arguments. In my field, there's arguments about how things ought to be. Lots of arguments about how things ought to be. And if you say, well, no, actually, whatever program this is, I don't know if it's neural or symbolic, or it learns, or it has RL, or Q, or whatever. Whatever it is, it's just supposed to go out and do a good job at solving those problems. And so maybe we don't have to argue about what it is. So that's a, a framing of the problem. And that makes me happy for like a nanosecond. And then I realize, oh, yeah, but it's my job as the robot engineer to try to find this, this program. And that's a very hard job. So that's what this whole talk about is about, is, is that job, is the job of finding a program to put in the head of a robot so that when it goes out into the world, it will do a good job in whatever world it finds itself in. OK, so how, do, how can we think about this kind of problem more generally, right? So how can we do this? Well, one strategy is to reverse engineer humans. Humans are good at, at least if I want to make robots that are very flexible, 
uh, you, I just wait for you to tell me how the brain works and then I do that and put it in my robot and we win, that's the way. Another strategy is to say, well, we got to brains by evolution, so maybe by doing offline evolutionary type stuff, we can figure this out. Or there's the traditional thing, which is uh, engineers are not terrible at building things that solve complicated problems, so maybe we should do what engineers tell us. So I think these are, you know, th three strategies. I would argue that right now in, in, in kind of modern robotics, we have almost a monoculture, uh, which is the uh, kind of replicating evolution view. Not exactly replicating evolution, but the idea that we're gonna do a ton of computation offline, right? And so the way this works, right? This is a, it's a kind of a funny thing, right? The idea, I think it's a, it's a romantic strategy, right? It's romantic because it's kind of beautiful and clean and simple. The idea is we build a bunch of simulators of all those worlds that this robot's supposed to work in, and we make a distribution of the objectives they might have and the constraints and the other agents that they might interact with, and we design a very general purpose machine learning algorithm, and we make a really big instance of that general purpose machine learning algorithm, and we hook it up to the simulators, and we run for a really long time, uh, and then it invents the best possible algorithm for that whole distribution of problems, and it figures out its own learning method, and it just it solves all the problems in the world, and we make robots at profit. Okay, so good. So it's plausible, I think, but only in principle. Like I personally don't. Th I'm, I am not so optimistic about this as a strategy. Mostly maybe just because I'm impatient or arrogant or some combination of these things, but I think that that's gonna to take too long. Um, and I think I know better, maybe. Okay, so my own view is that I would like to be inspired by what we know about natural intelligence, I would like to do some offline learning, and I would like to use some engineering principles too, and I'm hoping that that's gonna get me sooner to uh, an interesting point. Right, and so there's this, um, kind of general picture that we often draw in various kinds of learning kind of algorithms or, or analyses or so on, where if you build in strong priors, often you can learn pretty quickly. But it might be that in so doing, oh no, inevitably in so doing, you build in your own biases, and your biases might cripple the algorithm, might prevent it from actually learning the best possible thing. Right? So the, the blue curve maybe is, well, the humans try to bias what's going on, and the green curve is maybe we learn everything from nothing. Um, and, you know, I think the curves probably will cross, and I really have trouble predicting when that might be. So this is just, anyway, a framing of the problem. So, okay, so, so how are we going to go? Well, um, I don't want the robot doing reinforcement learning in my kitchen while it's making tea. <laughs> that seems clear, right? So somehow we have to, I think, build in a fair amount of stuff offline. Uh, figure out how to do that. So we have to start already pretty smart, I think, and then when we do learning in the world, in the wild, it has to be very efficient. So how can we do efficient learning, actually both offline and online? I think the key is compositionality, right? If we build in some systematic compositional system and learn the bits and pieces, then the bits and pieces might not be so hard to learn and we can put them together and solve new interesting problems. So, okay, so I'm gonna then now, this is like the most boring diagram in the whole world. This is the kind of diagram robot people make all the time. They could argue about the boxes all day. The boxes don't worry that much, but it's a kind of a decomposition of the system into some perception and some estimation and some thinking and some control. And I'm gonna talk about several instances in the context of this diagram of learning some parts and combining them with some existing kind of very general purpose reasoning algorithms in order to get a moderately interesting robot behavior. So that's the plan. Okay, so there's a ton of work on perception, the level of perception, I'm not gonna talk about that, some stuff on sp spatial modeling, uh, reinforcement learning for motor control is everywhere, so everybody does, I don't ever work on a problem that other people work on, I don't know, that's either I'm contrarian or chicken, but that's how I am, so I don't work on those problems. So let's talk about planning. So, okay, so what's planning? So planning, Popper says, oh, well, it's, 
like letting our hypotheses die on our stead, right? So if you have a policy, then you have to do what it tells you. If you have a predictive model of how the world works, then you get to actually think about what to do and decide whether to do this or that, right? So, um, and there's, you know, even the very first talk was great and it got at this question of like how model-based versus how model-free should we be? Um, and I think, you know, in the robotics context, it's easy-ish for us to write down planners that solve an enormous range of problems. They're slow sometimes, and then, but then you can compile the results of the planning into a policy as you go. So I think that's not a hardcore dichotomy, but I think that, that planning as an underlying ability lets you really generalize and solve really novel problems in a way that the kind of trying to come up with a policy doesn't necessarily allow you to do. So in robotics, we have to do task and motion planning. And it's an interesting problem setting because it combines sort of very low level geometric continuous space stuff, like how do I move my joints so that I can do things up here, along with higher level, more discrete choices, like should I fly through Heathrow in order to go somewhere? So I have to make high-level low level choices, high-level choices, how do we mix them together? Um, so we want to be able to do this. I'll say something about the models that we use, just to give you some insight into this, maybe. So there's, there's this uh, very beautiful formulation, actually, that came out of people in INRIA a while ago, and then it's gone here and there, of planning for robots in continuous spaces that has this, this beautiful topology picture, which I'll just tell you a little bit about. Um, so imagine that I want to take this remote and put it over there on that laptop. So I have remote, there's laptop. So if I think of the system right now that I'm thinking about, the system involves me, my joints, and the position of the remote, that's the system. But I can't control, I wish, I have mind control, I can't control the position of the remote uh, just like with my mind. I can't just wish it over there. So I can't move arbitrarily through the space that contains my joints and the position of, of the remote. Right? I can't just move the remote. In order to move the remote, I have to move myself to a situation where I'm controlling the remote. Then I have to move through a different continuous space to the place where the remote is here, then I can let it go, and now I'm in a different continuous space. So these leaves in those pictures are like continuous subspaces that I can move through. And the picking up of the remote is like changing what leaf I'm in, right? I change a continuous, I change which continuous subspace I'm moving around in. So on the one hand, we think in some ways down at this kind of geometric level of, 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 of moving through different subspaces. On the other hand, we can use actually sort of like very old school looking logical-ish representations of how to reason about these mode changes. So I would say the operation of picking up an object is a mode change. It changes which manifold I'm moving through. And there are conditions, there are only certain conditions under which I can make the mode change. In order to make the mode change of between me holding the object and me not holding the object, I, the object has to be somewhere, I have to be in some configuration, and I have to execute like the squeeze operation or something, and now I'm in a different manifold. So I can use high-level logical type abstractions to talk about actually the, 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 my ability to move through complicated space. So we're walking both lines here. But if I make a planner that does basic mode change operations in this kind of style, I can solve a ton of problems. And so a benchmark came out a while ago uh, from Chelsea Finn's group about, um, for, for meta learning, and it had all these actually pretty simple robot problems. But all we had to do was just to kind of code up the ability to pick and place and push objects. And without any learning, like zero, no learning, we could solve all these problems. Um, okay, so that seems good. We solved a lot of problems. Uh, there's some statistics, no learning. And we can also solve other kinds of problems. These are problems that involve applying force to things and reasoning about whether we can get enough torque in a certain situation. We can also apply the same basic algorithms to problems that reason about uncertainty, right? So here, the robot wants to believe that the spam can is in the top drawer. It looks in the, or the bottom drawer, it looks in the drawer to see if it's there. Uh, it's sad. Then it goes looking for it somewhere else, and then it'll get it and put it where it needs to go. 
So these are all examples of planning uh, in this mixed, continuous, and discrete kind of regime. Um, but OK, but everybody complains about this. So, so now every paper in robotics says, well, planning is good, and it would be excellent if only we had the models. But we don't have the models, so never mind that. OK, so then, I'm, then that's a little bit of a challenge. So I want to push back on that. So let's say, OK, let's say we don't know the shapes of the objects in our world. We don't have prior models of the objects. The robot's going to just have to deal. So in this work called MOM, Manipulation with Zero Models, we said, all right, I believe that there are rigid objects in the world, and also some simplifying assumptions just to make this thing go. And we have a robot, and we know how the robot works. Uh, we know all that multimodal motion planning stuff. And we're going to use pre-trained perception algorithms to try to recover a world state. And now this is out of date. These models are old. We use newer models. Next week, there will be different ones. Um, and that's good, right? So we need, what do we need, though? What's interesting is what we need is perceptual understanding of the properties of the world that are the ones that really govern what the robot should do. The least important thing is knowing the names of the objects. I have an object on my de desk that we don't know the name of, just to kind of make that point. Right? But what I do need to know, I need, I need some kind of segmentation. Like, is this object the same as that one? I need to be able to predict where I could reliably grasp something. I need to be able to predict where, if, what, what's a stable way that I could set it down on the table. So these are things I need to predict what's its approximate shape, given that I've only seen part of it. Those things are really important to me. And then like tertiary or more is what's its name. OK, so let's say now I, I can make a policy. It, it's still a policy. It's a policy that has a planner inside it. That's OK. It's, if you back up and defocus your eyes, it's a policy. It takes in images. It gives out torques. But what it does is it takes in images. It tries to kind of reconstruct a world state. It calls the planner on the world state, given a goal in first order logic from a human, tries to achieve the goal and so on. So it makes a plan, executes the first step of the plan, looks to see what happened, replans, etc. So that's how this works. It's almost never a good idea, if, even if you're a planning person, almost never do you actually execute the plan you made. You know, you know this traveling, right? When you're traveling, you make a plan, you execute the first step, and then you see what happened. You don't just keep doing the stuff. So you should never, ever just keep executing the plan. I think of a plan as a kind of like a proof that the first step is sensible. <laughs> That's it. OK, now I'll just show you some movies, because movies are fun. Here's one where, oh, actually, I want to stop it. Stop right there. OK, so the goal here was to put all the objects on the blue map. From the robot's perspective, it could only see the cracker box. So, and, oh, so this is a kind of an empty-headed robot. I mean, it's not what I wish it was, right? It doesn't have any state. It's Dory the robot. So it, it doesn't remember things right now, this particular example. So anyway, so it looks at the world. It sees the cracker box. It says, OK, there's a cracker box. I'm going to put the cracker, cracker box that blew out. makes the plan to do that. And then it does that. That's good. And then it looks at the table and says, oh, snap. Uh, there's other stuff. And then it makes a new plan. And the new plan required it to move the cracker box out of the way and put, get the other objects and put them on the map. But there was no learning. Like, there's no learning here. We can do smart stuff without learning. Uh, there was learning in the perception, but not in, in, the, in this stuff. Uh, here, it was supposed to put a yellow object on the blue mat. Um, so it's working at that. Um, it, <laughs> The motion planning is not our focus, so it's sufficient, but not great. Um, but there you go. Uh, here we told it to put every object in the bowl of the closest color. It doesn't know these objects. It hasn't seen them before. It misses sometimes. It's OK. You miss sometimes. All right, so it can do that. And this one I just think is fun. Uh, it thought there was one object, you know, but it turned out to be more. It's OK. It can keep working on that. <laughs> it can work on another robot with weirder objects. OK. It, it's like having baby movies. Robot people love to show robot movies. OK. OK, good. So what was that? That was a little bit of a demonstration that it's not an impossible thing to recover the models from perception that we could use for planning. Right? That's, it's not the, whole, the problem is not done. It's just a piece of evidence that this is something. Okay. 
So now, what about adding to our skill repertoire and modeling that skill repertoire in such a way that we can, uh, we can use them in our reasoning? So, okay, so how can, I'm gonna show you two bits and pieces about, about how to do this. So how can a competent robot acquire a new ability? So I'm gonna, again, assume that the RL people are going to town, there's a million of them, and they can learn skills, and they can learn how to cut and push and stir and pour, and all these things. So that's awesome. But what they can't learn right now is when you should cut versus stir versus pour, and under what circumstances it's gonna work. So if I wanna take a skill that somebody's learned and, and, and use it to help make dinner, there's still more work to be done. So I want to work on thinking about, given a skill, how could I build a model of it, a kind of a mental model of its preconditions and effects so that I can use it for planning. So I'll use pouring as an example. Here's a little cartoon. So you can imagine a pouring situation involves the vessel I'm pouring out of and the thing I'm pouring into, and there's some parameters that describe the situation, the relative position of the things, I don't know, maybe the viscosity of the liquid, maybe the gain of the controller that does the pouring, so there's a bunch of parameters that describe this. And what I want to know is, under what circumstances is it the case that if I call the pouring skill, I'll get stuff in the cup that, where I want it. And so I'm going to approach this again as trying to describe it in terms of one of these high-level planning operators. I want the result of this to be that the destination container has some liquid in it. I have this pouring skill that has some gain. And I have some preconditions, right, that the there's liquid in the source and some parameters of, these, of the situation. But the thing I really don't know, I really, really don't know, I can't write down, is, is a constraint on all the parameters that has the property that when that constraint holds of all the parameters, then the pouring thing will work, right? So that's a relation on the shapes of the containers and the, all that stuff. So, okay, so I would like to learn that. And we do some stuff to try to learn that. We pour and we call the pouring procedure in a lot of situations, roughly, and try to predict how well will it work out if I call the pouring skill in this situation. And it's important to note that training on a real robot is expensive. Um, so, you know, here's the robot. and it, we, we can't use liquid. That would really be a bad. So we use chickpeas instead. But we picked up a whole lot of chickpeas as part of this. Um, so we do, you know, kind of intentional experiment design. Right? We reason about what next experiment could I do in terms of scooping and pouring and so on so that I will maximize the information gain about this, about the situation. So I'm not going to go through this in detail. We're also, though, another thing that's important is we also want to learn not just one way of pouring, because we're going to take this operation and put it, embed it in the planner, and we're going to solve a lot of different problems. And maybe I prefer to pour with my right hand in this direction, you know, but if I'm like a fancy wine waiter, I have to be able to do this, or maybe there's something in the way, or I have to do it with my left hand. So I would like, if I can, to learn a kind of locus of, of ways of pouring that work out. So, okay, so I can then, in this case, I'm showing a case where it it's using pouring and pushing are the examples of things that it learned the operators for and added to its existing repertoire of stuff. Uh, again, we give it pretty general goals, like there should be liquid in this thing and this thing should be on the tray or something like that. And it just does what it does. Like we could put that, in this case, it knows the models of the objects. But we could put them anywhere on the table in different combinations and so on, and it does stuff. In a minute, it, okay, the next one is the one I like the best, so we'll let it do this, and then I'll talk about the next one. Um, so here, uh, you'll see that there's a bowl on one side. It's supposed to put stuff in the bowl, but it couldn't reach to pour all the way over in the bowl. So the planner just figured out, because of geometry and kinematics, not because we told it anything, that it should push the ball into the middle on that pour. So again, it's kind of not totally stupid. Okay, so here's another example. So that's, that's taking a learned skill maybe that came from <coughs> some low level learning and adding it to our repertoire. So here's another way that we can increase our repertoire of things that we know how to do. Um, I like this video. So the question is, what do you learn? What could you learn from watching this video? Um, 
concentrate for a minute. This is the moment of truth. Okay, so that was awesome. I've never shown this video before, and you guys do react great. Um, so, right. So, you saw, you got it, right? You saw, you said, oh, that's a cool trick. And if you were an excavator operator, you might not be able to do that as well as that, I'm sure you wouldn't be able to do it as well as that person, but you'd have, you got the idea. Totally you got the idea, and you would know how to practice that. Not by doing random flailing around with the bucket. Okay, so I want to do that for robots. So here's an example of a demo that we could do for the robot. Put, robot's supposed to put the red cube in the green box. And we give it a demonstration. Oh. Oh, says the robot. I see. Okay, so how do we get the robot to say, I see, I can use a hook? Because on the one hand, my planner is in principle capable of synthesizing that plan from nothing, but in practice, no possible way because of how many actions there are, right? So I could see that, that demonstration, and I could try to understand it in terms of forces and torques and trajectories. That would be a bad idea. I could try to understand it at the level of contact modes. That's better. Which objects are contacting which other objects at which points? But I would like to understand it eventually at some high level. Like, there's a strategy called hook a thing. So can I arrive at that understanding? Um, and so we, we have this thing called a mechanism. And you can think of it as, as a macro over contact modes, right? We talked about modes before in the multimodal planning. Um, and so we might say, well, that thing that you just did with a hook, that's a transit. That, that means that's me moving in free space. It's a grasp. It's a transfer with contact, right? That's me moving while holding a thing, but also contacting another thing. And then it's a place. So those things I already understand how to do. Those are my built-in basic skills. But now I see this demonstration, and I can see that demonstration as an instance of a sequence of these things. Um, so, OK, so a mechanism to represent a mechanism. We have a list of these contact modes. We have some parameters, right? So those contact modes are the discrete part of the plan. They say I should grab the hook, but not where. They say I should touch the hook with the object, the object with the hook, but not where. So those are continuous geometric parameters, which are going to change in every single instance of application of this mechanism. So I have to learn a distribution over those parameters so I can pick good ones, generally conditioned on the actual objects that I'm operating on. And then I can build an abstract model, kind of like the one I showed you about pouring, that would allow me to take this mechanism and put it into my repertoire. So the way it works, right, is we get the demo, we learn the structural part from one demonstration. That's the aha, like with the bucket. Then we do messing around with different kinds of objects, so some self-supervised stuff to learn that sampler, and then we can plan. Um, and it, you know, the search goes from impossible to possible, so that's good. And what's most important to me is that we can take these mechanisms that we've learned, add them to our planning model, and combine them in new ways, right? So here it's using one hook to get the other hook. So it hasn't seen an example of that. But once it's got the hook idea, it's like, oh, hook, I can do that. Uh, here's another example where it's supposed to um, keep the object from sliding off, to, to put it on that slanted surface. And it's already been shown a demonstration of the idea. It knows the mechanism of keeping something from sliding off by putting something in the way. But here it's using the hook to get the object, and then it's going to again use the hook as a, as a blocker to prevent the object from sliding off the ramp. Um, and there's some other cute tricks the robot can learn. Right? This, the robot has a big, fat hand, so it can't pick up a plate. Um, I'll show you one more here, and then another real robot, and then we'll go to another topic. I like this one, too. So this is another way to pick up a plate if you have a fat hand. Oh, that's a good one, too, right? It didn't invent that, right? But we showed it once, and now it can do it with new objects and new plates. That's the important part. Um, so, yeah. Okay, and, okay, so back to the grounding and perception. So now we used a perception system kind of like the one I showed you with mom. And these are new objects that hasn't seen them before, but it's like, oh, banana. Banana can be a hook. So it's using a banana now to do the hook thing. And it can pick up this bowl, too. I think we don't have time to study that. OK. 
Okay, good. So that's a way of adding to our repertoire. I have one more thing to talk about, which is building abstractions. And so a key to planning for long horizons is having abstractions. It's clear that you can't plan at the low motor level to come to Oxford, right? So somehow that, there has to be some hierarchical planning. And the question is, if you have a low-level model of how the world works, how can I build a high-level understanding of, of that? How can I build an abstraction that's effective for planning? And there's a lot of detail here. I just mostly just want to show you that it's also a thing that's an approachable problem. So in, in this piece of work, we start with some basic given predicates, right? Some given properties or relations of objects or, or tuples of objects, like the object is on another object or it's on the table. And then we have a system that can learn new predicates and uh, use and then, and then write a, a, a high level transition model, a high level kind of world model that's abstract using the new predicates it's invented. Um, and so, you know, basically, there's, there's this pretty category diagram, right? If I give you a set of predicates, concepts, whatever, tests, uh, and I take a low-level state, I can induce a new representation of it at an abstract level by just applying all my concepts to, all the, to the low-level state. And then I can learn a transition model at the abstract level. And then I need one more thing, which is that if I, if I do make a plan at an abstract level, I have to be able to ground it back down into low-level actions. And so I need some of these action parameter samplers that let me take an abstract action and ground it down at the low level. And so we, there's a kind of a whole pipeline of learning that lets us learn these different pieces and parts. And it's an interesting kind of combination of some old school symbolic sort of methods and some new school gradient descent, whatever type methods. Um, What's interesting is looking at the kinds of theories that it comes up with or the concepts that it invents. One of the things that, that I think is kind of fascinating is depending on what planning algorithm you give it to use, it comes up with a different conceptualization of the world. Like it comes up with an abstraction that works well for planning. The abstraction doesn't have to be true, right? Predictive, predictive power is not the best loss function for the model at the abstract level. The loss function for the model at the abstract level is, does it help me plan efficient? And so sometimes it's really wrong in a way, but it's workable uh, and maybe that's okay. Like maybe we have some high level wrong but workable theories, um, that's fine. So depending on what planning algorithm we use, we learn a different description of what's going on. There's a, you know, a kind of moderately complicated domain involving tools, and it learns predicates like this nail is being held by the robot, or some nail hasn't yet been placed on any contraption. So it, it kind of in, invents these, these properties of the domain that, again, make it more efficient for planning. And when we do that, we can do things like give it a couple of demos of you know, making coffee in this simulated case, with one cup or two cups, and it can generalize to different problems where it has to move things out of the way, where there's more or fewer cups, where the cups have different shapes and sizes and so on. Okay, let me talk a little bit about memory. Um, okay, uh, so this is actually, I think, the most currently most totally understudied problem in robotics, and it really bothers me because I think it's important, right? So if I want to make a household robot, it's gonna to have to go around in the house for, for days or weeks or months and like have a model of where stuff is. Like where did I put the tea last time or where does this person keep their coffee mug? And almost nobody as far as I can tell is thinking about this. So, but I, but, but I care. So we've done a, a little bit of work on this problem. So imagine that I have some ability to go around and recognize objects and, and segment them and, and compute some properties. But then I have intermittent access to the world state, right? So this is not the classic like tracking a car in my field of view problem. This is a re-identification problem. Kind of, right? So is that my coffee mug? So there's a classical approach, which is very beautiful. There's nice algorithms. But they all hinge on writing down all these models, which are really hard to write down. And you have to tweak like crazy. 
Like, oh, should I decide that this thing is actually my remote? Does it match the previous one? Is the match good enough that I should make a match? Or should I instantiate this as a new object? When should I decide that some object doesn't actually really exist after all? All these things require a lot of handwritten stuff that's just really hard to tune. So we thought, OK, handwritten stuff that's really hard to tune, that's what neural networks are good for. So we thought, OK, can we take the structure of the classical algorithm and make a neural network to learn the bits that are hard to tune? So here's an example. It is a slot-based memory, otherwise known as a database. Um, so there's a bunch of objects uh, represented in some latent space. And what the, we need to basically train it's, you know, train some, train some, some bits and pieces. And so one takes uh, observations and encodes them in a latent space. Another one figures out whether a new observation, how well does it match something that I, previous hypothesis. Uh, the, the, again, I'm not going to do the details of transition model, right? So how do these things change over time? Like maybe the coffee mug moves around a lot, but the cinnamon box less so. Um, and then how do I generate a readout that will be useful for something else? And so we've, you know, had a robot drive around a simulated world and, and uh, get observations of things. And we've done some stuff with real objects on tables. The results here and even the method are maybe not that important, but I think the problem is really important. What we find is maybe not surprising. Well, or maybe, I don't know. It's a, pla it's a particular place on, the, on this curve. If we use methods that don't know what problem they're solving, right, like an LSTM or some general set transformer, they don't work as well as the thing that knows the structure of this problem. I am sure with a vast pile of data and a bigger transformer, it would eventually be better than the thing that we built, but that would take a longer time. OK. So one more, I want to leave time for, for questions, and so this is good. So I have one, kind of one more little topic, and then I would love to just like, talk to you. So, okay, so in the middle of this thing, I have something called an execution manager, which is a sort of a dry name, but it's actually, I think, maybe the crux of the whole thing at some level. And so the way I think about this is, okay, think about the robot that has to, to live in your house for a year, right? There's hundreds or thousands of objects in its world. The time horizon is really long. There's all these actions it can do. Maybe the spatial scale is big. It is a huge problem. But we are a robot of very little brain. And so we can't fit that whole huge problem into our brain at once. There's no possible way. Right? So typically, when Computer science people are faced with like, oh, I have a big problem and, and I have to solve it. They're like, oh, well, I have to scale up. I have to find a way for my algorithm to solve bigger problems. <laughs> but I want to think about it differently. I want to say, no, really, there are kind of mathematical and theoretical computer science reasons why I can't solve a problem bigger than a certain size in the brain that I have. And so what I need to do is actually think about going through the world, continually mapping the problem, the giant, enormous problem that faces me into a sub-problem that fits in my brain. And so the question is, how can we do that? So imagine that we have that, that execution manager. Now here's a fancier name for it. We'll call it the dynamic abstraction formulator. Uh, so that's going to say, well, OK, given the world that I'm in at the moment, and my objectives, and what I've done so far, and so on, what problems should I solve next? And can I map the whole big world and the current state of everything into a sub-problem that I should solve? Uh, and maybe we can use machine learning to learn the, some metacognitive strategies that help us map the giant problem down into something that fits in our head. So I'm just going to go through some examples of things that we've done they give you a hint of, of, of how that might go. So one example is learning what objects are important, right? So my state space is kind of exponential in the number of objects in my world. Uh, and so if I could reduce the number of objects that I'm thinking about at the moment, that would be good. And you know, arguably, you can't, you can't think about all the objects in this room. You're, you're like, if you can think about all the objects in your backpack or your pockets. Um, 
So how does that go? So one idea would be, well, if we could take a description of the current world state and a description of the goal, find my keys, then maybe I can map my big problem into a smaller problem and solve that. So that's what we do. We try to use graph neural networks to predict a scoring value for each object. How likely is it that we think that it's really critical for solving this problem? And then we make a problem formulation that just takes the most critical objects. So one thing that's really important about search in general is that it's sort of exponentially hard to solve a problem, but quick to check a putative solution. So what we can do is we can make a small problem, solve it, get a solution, but check it in the real problem to see if it's good. If it's good, it's good, and we do it. If it's not good, then we can add a few more objects and go again. So that's one, one strategy for turning a big problem into a small problem. Another thing that we've done is kind of learning to decompose or reduce state spaces. Uh, you might learn to say, you know, I, am, I need to find water, but I'm going to do that by just in this building, right? I'm not going to consider all the ways I could find water. That's just too much. Or I'm gonna, so I can put restrictions on what actions I take. I can put restrictions on what parts of the state space I am willing to visit, and that can also make things more efficient. The thing that I'm most enthusiastic about, although we still haven't really applied learning to it, is temporal hierarchy. Um, so uh, I've spent a lot of my personal hacking time building a hierarchical planning and execution system. It works like this. It starts with a high-level goal. It makes a plan at some abstract level. Then it takes the first sub-goal in that plan and makes a plan at a little more, more refined level and takes the first sub-goal in that plan and makes a plan at a little bit more refined level until finally, you know, maybe that green P down there, it reaches a primitive action and it does it. Right? Because actually, if you look in the AI literature, there's a ton of literature on hierarchical planning, but it's all about making a whole plan. Like, but a whole plan for me to get from Boston to Oxford is not a sensible thing. Completely not a sensible thing, right? You, you know, I don't know what, how I, what, what my footfalls in Heathrow are going to be. That would be nuts, right? So I don't want a whole hierarchical plan. I want a plan at a high level of abstraction, and I want it to be a kind of, again, a proof that the first step is reasonable, and actually such a good proof that the first step is reasonable that I'm willing to do the first step, right? So that means that I have to believe that the coordination constraints, the things that matter to me, due to the fact that I'm going to Heathrow, have been exposed at the high level. So the example, I have a good example now, is bringing my um, UK plug adapter, right? So if I just plan to get to the Boston airport any old way without thinking about the plug adapter, then I would get there without the adapter, and then I'd be in trouble later. So if I'm going to plan at an abstract level, I have to, again, metacognitively figure out that there's some variables that are so important that I have to actually promote them to the almost highest level. And my power adapter is one. Um, <laughs> I've, and I've learned, oh, I've learned <laughs> from experience about the power adapter. Um, so this hierarchical replanning and, and execution thing, um, I'm very fond of. Just one more, one more point about it is, it also gives us a way to think about intentions, right? So if I, if I want to use, you know, uh, folk psychology language, right? Beliefs, desires, and intentions. I beliefs about how the world, the world state. We already got that. My desires, maybe that are my objectives, and the intentions are this stack. And I use this stack, right? So for instance, if something goes wrong in the low-level plan, right? I said in the first system that what we did was replan all the time. You can't really afford to replan everything all the time. You don't want to reconsider your career goals when the light changes in a way that you weren't expecting, right? So if 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 it turns out that I uh, can't that you know I hear that the T is broken down in Boston, that's not such a surprise. Um, that might invalidate my lowest level plan. I don't you know rethink coming to the conference. But, but so that's okay. I can pop the lowest level plan off of this stack and make a new plan down at that level. Oh, I'll get a new one. So you, it helps you kind of manage um, uh, 
reconsideration and reevaluation based on on surprises. Uh, yeah, and so there's a there's a way to integrate this whole thing into our kind of symbolic planning infrastructure. Okay, so what do I think? In the end, I don't know, maybe, maybe, human-like generalization ability could stem from learning world models that are combinatorially and efficiently reusable via built-in architectural constraints. We can get this by having factored state representations and lifted and factored action representations. And we can reason efficiently by picking good abstractions and by learning cognitive strategies for mapping big problems into small ones. There's a bunch of things I wish I knew about natural intelligence, like, Oh, I have this e enormous list, so I'm hoping during the break you'll just tell me the answers and I will go and, and use them, right? So like, what's really built in? I would like to know that. Uh, what corners can we safely cut, right? So the, here's an interesting thing. Computer scientists understand how to talk about optimal algorithms. That's what we do all day long because it's easy. It's clear you know when you have one or when you don't. As soon as you say, oh no, it's too hard to have an optimal algorithm, then we're a little bit at sea about saying, well, what, what would it be good to have if it's not the best thing? So, I don't know, what corners can humans cut and still do okay in our world? Um, what kind of modularity? Like, modularity matters a lot to me as an engineer. What kinds of modularity are there in brains and can we take advantage of that? Stuff about how we encode spatial information, not just for navigation, but more like, you know, could I fit this object in that hole? Or, uh, you know, how should I make a plan to move around when I'm carrying this big pipe or something? Um, what about memory about objects? Where are my car keys, images, language, stuff like that? Uh, also, scales of learning, right? So we there's, I think right now there's this hyper focus on reinforcement learning for learning behaviors, right? And lots of people have talked about that here, but there's a whole bunch of other really important kinds of learning, and I'm a tiny bit worried that reinforcement learning is an attractor. It, it's not wrong and it's not bad, but I don't think it's the whole story. So maybe we should like be sure that we don't forget all the other things. Um, yeah, okay, so with that, I would like to thank my colleagues and students, and I will let you watch some robot outtakes while I take questions, so thank you. Um, thank you for this fantastic talk. I think that it should be really inspiring to us because if I look at it, I think most of the tasks we have been seeing that we expose humans to, they are object detection or reinforcement learning with three states and two actions. So today we saw what it's all about. Your robots did mostly tasks that are more complex than many of the tasks we use. It's about tea making, sandwich making, peanut butter and jelly sandwich making. So that's, that, that's exactly. So I think that's, that was uh, really inspiring. So you had questions to us, but I think we have this burning question. How should we use what you have presented to know more about the left arm in one of your first slides? How do we use this to understand better, to reverse engineer um, how humans do all these tasks. How do we plan? What are our belief states? Yeah, so the, no, the, so that's, a, that's a good question. So, the, so, you know, how, what... The thing is, I mean, I think we just have to talk together because I don't know enough about... I mean, I, I talk to my colleagues at MIT more and more uh, about brain and cognitive science and I'm learning the kinds of experiments that they can do and so on. But finding... It's, it's, it's hard... I mean, you know, people only show their robots on their best days, right? So <laughs> this, it, it kind of works, you know, in carefully organized circumstances. But if we had to pick any task and, and put a robot up against a human, the human would win. Like, except for welding reliably and quickly. Um, so it's right now, I think, I feel like in a way we're not quite ready to do like head-to-head -head experiments. But we can test hypotheses about metacognition or planning of various kinds by, you know, by trying a lot of different algorithms. It's easy for us to try a lot of different algorithms. And in any given thing I've implemented, there's like 12 configuration parameters, which might or might not correspond to interesting cognitive hypotheses. I don't know. So, uh, yeah. 
Hi, thank you for a fascinating talk. I'm puzzled by some gap that I think, if I understood it correctly, between your introduction and the rest of the talk. You said you're going to, you favored kind of an offline evolutionary approach for robots, or let them evolve, if I understood correctly. Uh, let them no, evolve. Actually, I'm, I, I was trying to argue that that should not be the only tool. Oh, the only, robot. okay, because then I missed to see how. Okay, so yeah, what is <laughs> let me ask you a different about? thing. So he's talking yeah. about evolution. Yeah, evolution put a lot of effort, if you look at our sensory organs, the eyes, the hands, uh, anything, a lot of effort and probably not as a single step to create or evolve wonderful sensory organs that are capable of many things. Robotics is, I don't know, light years beyond Light, many light years behind this step because the sensory organs in robotics are really degenerated. What, what, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, no, that's right. The sensors are terrible, the actuators are terrible, they can't feel anything. We get a little torque information, we do get some, some feedback. Um, so, right, so the easiest way for roboticists to like hide is to say, oh, the hardware is terrible and that's why my demos are no good. On the other hand, a human can teleoperate any of the hardware that I have shown you and get it to do really good things. Humans with a, with a hook as a prosthesis can do incredible things. So I don't think I should get, I mean, if we had better hardware, we could make better stuff. But I think our hardware is plenty good to test uh, the, the question of intelligent behavior. Oh, and there is. There are there are a lot of people working on, um, especially on on like better, like tactile sensing, better tactile sensing, putting skin on a robot, making the robot soft and flexible. So there is there is a lot of work in that direction, and that's important. Um, but I don't think. It's necessary before we can address some other important questions. Yeah. Um, we'll take one more question. Um, great. Oh, that was an amazing and inspiring talk. I feel like we have as much to learn about the way you've made the robots solve the problem. We'll just take those insights into the cognitive sciences and test them. One of the things that you solved is the demonstration with the hook and that allows the robot to now have a new concept and make these, what do you call it, macro modules. I didn't get the phrase right, but that, that was the idea. So I, wanted, I wondered if you could unpack a little bit more. Do you have to, say, put the robot in a mode where it's like, I'm going to teach you something, I need you to set up your resources so you can form a new primitive, or does it learn that that's something new and learns to discover a new primitive? Or, and how does it know to see the world in terms of the concepts it knows? Yeah, I'm just quite curious how you solve that at the different levels of representation. Right, good. So right now it's pretty set up. Yeah, that's okay. Um, I mean, solving it at all is right. a win. So yeah, that's... It gets the demonstration in simulation, which means that it can feel the forces. So what's interesting is the difference between getting a video of a thing and feeling the forces is big. Um, not insurmountable, I'm sure, but anyway, so that's a, one important thing there. Okay. And it's totally pre-programmed to understand. So the idea of mode changes, I think, is deep. Like the, the idea that the way the robot's controlling the world changes discontinuously. And you want to find those discontinuous changes in the dynamics as the primitives. So it's already got built-in primitives that are about those discontinuous changes. And so when it sees the demo, it automatically parses it where the discontinuous dynamics changes are. Yeah, interesting. So it sounds yeah. like one of the key ideas is yeah. instead of trying to get it from the vision, it goes through its own sort of sensory system. Interestingly, there's lots of neuroscience on that idea. Yeah, I bet there is, right. <laughs> if you feel it, it's much better than if you watch somebody. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. We have a quick announcement from Laura about lunch, and then we'll go on to our contributed talks.
lot more movement than I was expecting. <laughs> Hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, so I just wanted to explain that lunch is going to work slightly differently today. Um, so we have lunch in the two spaces. Um, in the marquee is just lunch. And uh, lunch upstairs in the room across from here, we're going to have a diversity lunch, uh, which means that we're going to have a guided discussion of ways that we can improve diversity in the field of uh, cognitive computational neuroscience. Um, so I really encourage you to, to come along. Um, it w goes from, from 12 until 1.30 today. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Chung Wang from Peking University. She's going to talk about a computational shortcut to coordination, common knowledge, and neural alignment. Thanks. Okay, uh, thanks for introduction. Uh, imagine you and your friend come to this large square for the first time, and you are separated in a crowd with each other. So, and, so, and luckily, your, all of your, your cell phones died. So you can't call your friend. Where would you go in this square to meet with your friend? Can anyone give me an, an, an answer? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I guess most of you will say that's a blue tower. Yeah, and uh, this will, in fact, this is consistent with the answer of most people. That means the probability you meet with your friend under this blue tower is very high. But think about it, you have never been to this place before and never discussed this situation with your friend before. So how do you know you can meet with your friend here? This type of question is called coordination, which requires animals to select complementary actions to achieve common goals. It's one of the most important type of cooperation, which can be seen uh, in our everyday life and also animal. In this video, uh, we, rats can coordinate on the timing of their actions to get the reward. But this actually brings up a challenge. According to research in, uh, AI, in game theory and multi-agent AI, agents may coordinate through a complex recursive reasoning process. And again, in this example, you need to figure out where will my friend go? And then you may think, where will my friend think I will go? And then you think, where will my friend think I will think he will go, right? So as you can see, this, this process is is slow and cognitively difficult and error prone. So how do we humans achieve fast but effective coordination in a seemingly effortless manner? Uh, one proposal by Thomas Schelling proceeds that some kind of common knowledge which can facilitate flexible and intuitive coordination. Let me try to explain what does that mean. Uh, for the email users, the idea of common knowledge can be expanded by the difference between CC and BCC. When the email is CC'd um, to several recipients, which recipient will, get, will, receive, will know the list of other people who also receive this email. So the content of the, this email is the common knowledge among all the recipients. But when the email is BCC'd, the recipient does not know uh, what else other who also receive this email. So in terms of information transmission, there is no difference between CC and BCC. But for noise state, the C they are different. The CC is common knowledge. And also common knowledge, in fact, can largely change our human behavior. Uh, in this famous story, The Emperor's New Clothes, when the, uh, when the little boy says, Oh, the, the emperor is naked, naked. and uh, so, so, in fact, his announcement didn't bring something new information to people. Instead, his announcement turning some people's private knowledge into something public know, and which facilitates the coordinated protest against the emperor. And again, in this example, um, 
chances are people may have some kind of common sense about the landmark in this area and can use that common sense to, as a shortcut to coordination. And over the past decades, people in many different fields have tried to characterize common knowledge, but were uh, not very successful. This is because common knowledge can be influenced by many different can, by many different factors, such as cognitive, psychological, and social factors, and therefore extremely flexible and make it difficult to measure. So here, instead of we turn this question around, instead of asking what is common knowledge, we ask if common knowledge supports coordination, what is neural implications? We reason that the existence of common knowledge among group of individuals implies aligned knowledge representation in the brains of these people, which may so it may be associated with uh, how people can coordinate with others. And in order to um, marry this aligned knowledge representation in the brain, uh, we use a well-established method of neural alignment. It has been widely studied, reported that there is a correlated neural activity across brains in socially interacting animals, such as bats, mice, and humans. These studies are great. But they are also correlational. That is, we don't know whether neural alignment indeed reflects social behavior or is just some byproduct. So, such, such as um, shared representations of motivation, social context, and so on. So to address this, we contacted two separate studies. In study one, people passively viewed landscape images in the fMRI scanner, and they didn't know, they did, don't, there's no need for them to make decisions. And in study two, we recruited a separate cohort of subjects to per, play a classic pure coordination game. And the idea is that we want to use the neural alignment measured in study one to predict the coordination decisions in study two. And there are two advantages of by doing so. Uh, first, if neural alignment indeed reflects knowledge, it should be independent of the decision-making process and therefore can be measured with the passive viewing task, right? And also, if this knowledge is really common among many people, it should be measured in one cohort of subjects and could be used to predict coordination decisions in another group of subjects. Okay, so now let me tell you more details about the coordination game. Uh, basically, our pictures in study one were randomly grouped into groups of four and used as a stimuli in the coordination game. And in this game, subjects need to choose the same picture as others and also know that others also want to choose the same as themselves. Okay, so, and we are interested in how likely subjects can match their choices with one another. However, it's possible that choice, choice alignment may be um, resulted from some preferences, some, uh, from some similar preferences, similar attention, um, or some other similarities contained in individual decision process that is, that is irrelevant to social interactions. So we include a control condition where subjects choose a picture in any way they want. And as you can see here, although the picture were randomly grouped, subjects can indeed coordinate to some extent. The probability of aligning their choices was significantly higher than the matching individual condition. And for fMRI analysis, uh, using a well-established method of intersubject correlation, we quantified for every voxel in the brain how active how active pattern in one subject when passive viewing each image um, correlated with other subjects. And these correlations uh, were then used to predict online subjects' choice probabilities. And this analysis identified a set of brain areas partially overlapped with the deformal network, uh, which has been implicated in shared representation of social knowledge, which can predict the coordination decisions even after controlling for choices in the individual condition, and with the, most with the strongest effect uh, seen in the PCC. 
Uh, however, a similar analysis shows that no regions except for the viral area can predict individual choices. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, we can sort of all 200 pictures along the axis of PCC alignment. And we can see in this example, the order of PCC alignment corresponds well, well with how likely subjects are going to choose these pictures in the coordination condition. And in comparison, this picture, uh, the last one, is actually the picture mostly chosen in the co individual condition. And this suggests that the PC alignment likely have nothing to do with individual choices. And moreover, we extract the row FRMI patterns from the PCC. And we can see there are more similar row active patterns for the most, un most aligned picture uh, between two randomly grouped subjects compared with the least aligned picture. So what, does, what has happened? Uh, we guess uh, one possibility is that when subjects pass viewing these pictures, their brain automatically represents their knowledge associated with the stimulus. And inter-brain correlation may reflect some knowledge alignment about this. And during coordination decisions, our brain may use some sort of metacognition to figure out this shared knowledge, and flexibly use those to make coordination decisions. So if this is true, so we would expect the pre-existing knowledge or common knowledge uh, may be used to support novel decisions. To test this, uh, we constructed novel decisions based on the PCC alignment. Uh, particularly, we combined the pictures with the highest PCC alignment with those, with, uh, with those uh, associated with lowest PCC alignment. Mm -hmm. And this allows us to make sharp, very sharp predictions for choice. That is, subjects will choose the picture with high PCC alignment more frequently compared to these pictures. So we generate more than 6,000 novel trials and give them to another cohort of online subjects. And we find that, consistent with our prediction, subjects indeed more likely to select pictures with high PCC alignment compared to pictures with low alignment. Uh, and importantly, such prediction was not seen in the trials constructed using alignment in lower level brain areas, such as the viral cortex or semantics related infertemporal gyres. And also, such prediction was not seen in the matching individual condition. Okay, so how does common knowledge support coordination? We construct a model assuming arbitration between two strategies. Particularly, we assume that our brain may evaluate the amount of knowledge, common knowledge contained in choice options. And if the amount um, is larger than an unknown parameter theta, the brain will more rely on a knowledge-based strategy, that is, selecting pictures with more prominent, prominent common knowledge with higher probability. And here, we approximate common knowledge using PCC alignment. Otherwise, the brain will rely more on a reasoning-based strategy. And uh, um, I, would have to, I would be too happy to um, tell you more about this model after the talk, but here, I, let me just give, the, give you the intuition. Uh, following a well-established social reasoning theory, namely um, quantitative hierarchy, we assume that people have different levels of sophistication in social reasoning. A naive or level zero player will align their choices with those in non-social individual behavior. And a level one player, in turn, will best respond to level zero players. And level two players will recursively best respond to level zero and level one players, and so on. We fit this model with our choice data, and based on the value, as the value estimate of the theta, we can classify the trials into two types. And consistent with the model, for the trials where ISC larger than theta, choices are better explained by knowledge-based predictions compared with reasoning-based prediction. And the opposite is true for, for the trials where ISC lower than theta. And very importantly, we reason that even the knowledge-based um, 
strategy indeed provides a decent shortcut for bypassing the complex process of social reasoning, we would expect a shorter response time for the trials with larger amount of common knowledge. And consistent with this, uh, the within subject comparison between uh, two types of trials in RT uh, classified by the estimated theta showed faster decisions in the trials where IAC larger than theta. And notably, our model contains no information about the response time, but only the PCC ISC. So the ability to explain both choice and RT is consistent with the idea that common knowledge may facilitate faster, easy, and effective coordination. Okay, so to summarize, in this study, we are interested in the question of how people flexibly co coordinate with others in novel situations. And instead of focusing on reasoning and inferences, we take a unique perspective of knowledge alignment. And for the consistent ways showing this common knowledge hypothesis, we found that aligned activity in the PCC reliably, specifically, and flexibly predicts coordination decisions. And also, the ISC-based strategy arbitration model explains both choice and RT, which is in line with the point that common knowledge may serve as a shortcut. But our study also opened new questions. What exactly encoded in the PCC? And how are brain use common knowledge during the decision making? During decision making? And can we train neural network maybe to align knowledge representation and to facilitate the coordination between humans and the machines? And hopefully these questions could be addressed in the near future. Okay, uh, thanks to my advisor, Lucia, and my lab my lovely collaborator, Han Wang, and all other lab members. And finally, I want to advise for our lab and also for myself. And hopefully, turning this information into our common knowledge would help us coordinate better. Okay, thanks for your listening. much for the fantastic talk. We have time for one quick question while our next speaker is getting set up. Uh, I think you got up first, so go for it. Okay, thanks. Uh, so you were calling it common knowledge, but I was wondering if you had a sense of what sorts of features in the image people were using to make their decision? Uh, this is a good question. Uh, in fact, we, uh, because uh, we don't have a common hypothesis about what common knowledge is really uh, and we, make, we did a data-driven data analysis, and we find that especially for the PC alignment, it may be correlated with how famous this picture is, or how we are familiar with this picture is, and how, or how okay. unique this picture is. But so we don't have a very quick, precise answer about what is knowledge really in our study. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Hua Dong Xiong from University of Arizona. He's going to talk about neural network modeling and how it reveals diverse exploration behaviors via state space analysis. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know if that will. So I can see my slides. Yeah, one sec. Are the slides ready? Oh, one second. Um, it's not working. What's that? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, there we go. Okay. I can, cool. Oh, I, I, I can use this. So how, how can I use this one? Um, I so, think the... I don't think the USB... Does somebody have the HDMI connector that has the USB thing in it? Okay, I, I, I think uh, I will use this, hopefully. Okay. Okay. Oh, does that work? All right. I think, I, I think, I think. <laughs> Take it away. Okay. okay, so thank you for having me. Hi. So in this, talk, in this study, I wish to, we introduced the use of artificial neural network as cognitive model to understand human exploration. And we found it offer a more intricate picture of exploration than traditional cognitive model. 
So first, I would like to thank you, all, all my incredible collaborators, Jian Li at the, universe, at the UCSD, uh, Marcelo Mata at the NYU, and my advisor, Bo Wilson, at the University of Arizona. So as researchers, we constantly face the explore, explore, explore dilemma. Should I delve into a new uncharted research area or further my study in an area I'm already familiar with? So to study how human or animals balance their exploration and, and exploitation, we often use the two-arm bandit task. So imagine there's two slot machines, so the reward of one is, no, and is unknown and the reward of the other is known to you. So which one do you want to choose? So, so this type of task shares less our, our, our decision-making tendency. So in your task, participants are presented with two slot machines. Here is an example of how reward changes. So 90% of the time, the reward of this machine stays constant, but there's 10% of a chance it changes, drawing a value uniformly from the, uh, the interval between 1 and uh, 99. You can see another stay, another changes. So for the alternative uh, machine, it follows the same rule and change independently, you can see that. Uh, yes, let's walk through the task to give you a sense of how it works. So first, uh, you pick the uh, blue slot machine and earn just one point, and uh, it's not impressive. So you switch to the, to the uh, alternative uh, machine and get 80 points, and you, you are satisfied, and you know most of the time uh, the rewards should remain consistent, so you stay and get uh, 80 points again, and uh, then you exploit this machine for another five trials, all giving you 80 points, you are happy. But remember the machine can, uh, can change, so unfortunately this time the reward drops 20. So now, so if you stay, you have a high probability to get 20 points. Remember, and the, and the, but the blue machine is untouched for like eight trials. So the reward of it might have changed. So it, if it doesn't change, reward is one. But the high probability is changed. But if it changed, it's, it's 50. So it's, it, 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 the expectation is 50. So it's better than 20. So do you want to risk a switch? And uh, so in our task, three state variables uh, are sufficient to characterize the optimal behavior. So the first is the current reward from the option you just picked, so it's 20. The second is the reward from the alternative option you didn't choose, here it was one. And the third is the state count. Uh, so representing the, um, it, it representing the uncertainty of the alternative reward. So here it's eight. It's just a kind of an uncertainty measure. So now, we visualize the, a, a prototypical model free uh, reinforcement learning agent uh, which can solve this task. So we set the state count to be one. This is, this is one of our uh, state variable. And the plot the decision boundary against the other two uh, state variable. So the, the, the agent shifts in the real region and uh, stays in the blue. It basically uses a greedy strategy. They only care about uh, the uh, immediate reward. So, and you can find that as we vary the state count, so, which is essentially the uncertainty of alternative rewards, the slope of decision boundary becomes steeper. So this, just, this suggests a growing re, a dependence on current rewards and less on alternative reward as this uncertainty rises. Uh, the, yes, and the, when the uncertainty is large enough, the decision boundary becomes parallel to alternative reward, which it doesn't care about the alternative reward at all. So, so let's see the strategy of a model-based agent. We know model-free agent doesn't know the transition structure of the task, so it, it's as greedy. However, the model-based agent uh, tends to shift more. You can see, as you can see from the decision boundary moving to the right. So especially on the high state count, so the, the, the light yellow, uh, the light yellow uh, line. Because I think uh, because it understands the the environment, how the environment changes, so it can use exploration to gain information and use that information to get a future, get a, make better uh, decision and get a better future rewards. So yes. So our step, our first step is trying to fit the behaviors to reinforce learning model. So for these two arm bandit tasks, the fitting performance is rather poor for both the uh, model free and model based agent. Uh, so each those represent one subject. 
So you can see, so the, the, the metric is, is the negative log likelihood, and we evaluate it through nested cross the validation. So, so recognizing the complexity of the human behaviors, uh, we introduce recurrent neural network as the cognitive model, so which is designed for modeling complex sequences. So we found that our recurrent neural network significantly outperforms the reinforcement learning model in predicting human behaviors. And, uh, who, to, who, to, and uh, this is a basic uh, structure of our recurrent neural network. So you know, the input are the previous action, our current action and the rewards, and we add some uh, subject information, we give it to the neural network, and uh, we pretend to predict the next action of humans. So I have just shown you that the recurrent neural network best describes the uh, human behaviors. But, what, but you may want to know what insight did it offer into how we make decisions. So here's the decision boundary of model free animal based agent uh, for reference. Uh, we simulate our channel recurrent neural network to get a decision boundary of fitted humans. So you can find that the recurrent neural network reveals that a human employed the distinct strategy from reinforcement learning model. And the different individuals have a very diverse uh, decision boundary. So, mo yes, so moreover, uh, we have another uh, task condition. We have another task condition where the environment is more volatile, so it changes, it's changed faster. So, and uh, both reinforcement learning agents slightly alter its decision boundary. And you, can, and you can note that the slope of the decision boundary becomes steeper. So it, it means that the, un, the uh, uncertainty is accumulated faster on the high volatility. And uh, the for recurring unit I work, uh, things become very interesting. So where some, uh, some humans show minor change in decision boundary, some change dramatically. And uh, now of this is predicted by reinforcement learning model. And we, and we found that in a very simple task, the, the behavior dynamics and the, and the heterogeneity of a human is, is rich. So we have seen that in the state space, recurrent neural network surpassed the reinforcement, le uh, reinforcement learning model in capturing diverse nature of human behaviors. But is this the only reason, the advantage of recurrent neural network? So to test this, we use all information in the state space to predict human behaviors. So for each state count, we think this variable introduces nonlinearity. Uh, we use the current reward, uh, current reward, alternative reward, and their interaction as a regressor to predict the next action. And the fitting performance is still worse than recurrent neural network. So this suggests that a recurrent neural network must some capture something beyond the state, the three-dimensional state space. Then we want to test whether the behavior is Markovian within the state space. So yes, so if the behavior is if the behavior is Markovian, then each state should uniquely define the action probability. So in other words, the action probability are uncorrelated when you know the state. So to investigate this, we condition on these three uh, state variables and analyze the correlation of action probability uh, between the previous trial and the current trial. So for all a reinforcement learning model across all conditions, we found no autocorrelation beyond the state space. But however, we found a recurrent neural network ut ut utilize additional information uh, beyond the state space. Some demonstrate a weak history dependence conditional state. Some, uh, some demonstrate a strong uh, history dependence conditional state. And this autocorrelation also vary across, uh, across different state count for one subject. And you may wondering what, okay. You may wondering what uh, what additional information that the recurrent neural have or use. So we are we, we have been scratching our heads too. So if you have any clue, find me after the talk. <laughs> uh, so our our finding is our find, we found that even in this very simple task, human exploration behavior is rich and diverse. And these behavior dynamics are better captured by recurrent neural networks than reinforcement learning model. 
a recurrent neural network also captures autocorrelation beyond the state space. And this suggests that there are latent dimensions in exploration behavior across different subjects. And moving forward, we, our aim is to delve deeper into the dimensionality of the uh, human exploration. We also want to uh, decipher the latent the, uh, dimension of the latent dimension that the recurrent neural network found. And uh, we want to map the recurrent neural network dynamics to biological brain dynamics. And I'm, I'm glad you are here. And the reason by being here, I think uh, the community demonstrates a kind of a shared vision for artificial neural network in cognitive model as we, as we did in yesterday. They, they really set a stage for, our, so for my talk. <laughs> Thank you. And to dive in deeper into this uh, topic, please refer to another amazing work of my collaborators. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the beautiful talk. We have time for a few questions. Um, Hi. Yeah, great talk. Um, I'm wondering if you've tried a uh, cross-subject cross-validation? Like, I'm wondering to what extent these networks are capturing, like, subject-specific, like, idiosyncratic heuristics and biases yeah. and whether or not... Yes, that we haven't do that because we think a different subject have a very diff 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 different strategy to, to solve this task, so we didn't uh, held out uh, the subject level. But I wonder if some, uh, many subjects might use something like a reinforcement learning yes, strategy. Yes, yes, yes. I think uh, we can do that, but we haven't uh, given it a try. I think one, one, one problem of this type of analysis, like uh, different people, it's, it's not only different people use different strategies, but if you, you fix, if you use the neural network to fix some kind of strategy, and the, and, and the neural network should extrapolate their strategy to, to other subjects, which makes it fit in bad. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, great talk. Thanks. <clears throat> I was wondering, do you have any evidence that humans differ in how they represent the number scale, the rewards? Is that what the neural networks reflect, that some humans condense the number scale, the reward scale more than others, or have some nonlinear scaling of the... Uh, yes, yes. So we actually, we... We've, so I, I, my, um, my understanding of your question is sense to, to the reward scale. So I think the answer is yes. So for some kind of a binary, binary... Uh, binary reward in humans, so the, the human strategy is very fixed, but for this kind of a continuous task, people just uh, reflect very differently, and, uh, and we show, in, I, I, I didn't show this in my slide, in our, my talk, but uh, we found a very different sensitivity to uh, reward for different, so people have a different utility function, actually. Any question more? Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Nirmo Netta um, from uh, Max Planck UCL, um, and he's going to talk about how reward morphs non-spatial cognitive maps in humans. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. I'm Nir. I'm a PhD student with Nico Schuch in MPI Berlin. And I wanted to talk to you today about a project, how reward morphs cognitive maps in non-spatial cognitive maps in humans. So let's say you explore this beautiful valley. It stands to reason that the brain will create some sort of a representation of this environment. However, some areas in this environment might be more exciting as the right next to water or food. So the brain might create an overrepresentation of this area because when you stand five steps from the reward or two steps from the reward, you really want to know where you are. This increase of representation might come at the expense of other areas that might be less exciting. And indeed, when reward was introduced to an environment, Animal work has shown that there's an increase of representation there, both clustering of play cells, as well as, field, as, as grid cells shifting certain fields towards the reward. But how do we translate that to behavior? In a different line of work, researchers artificially decrease the spacing between fields, and in the replication of this idea in humans, it was shown that objects that are placed in areas with dense fields are perceived farther apart. So we brought these ideas together, and we said what we think is happening is that reward in a map increased the neural representation in its area, and it will be translated to an increase in perceived distances in that area. So what we did is we put people in the scanner for four sessions on two days. 
where in the first session we have a measurement of the map, then it's followed by a reward learning task, the next day another reward learning task, the same task, and at the end another measurement. So as you can imagine, we have a pre versus post measurement to see what, how reward change the representation in between. And what is this task? So a cognitive map is trees that could have different number of leaves, the x-axis, and different number of fruits on them. And in the perceptual task, participants in each trial first saw a target tree, which is a location in this map. And then it was followed by two additional trees, reference trees A and B. And the task was to identify which tree is more similar to the previous tree they saw, A or B. Now this is another way of asking which distance is shorter. shorter. Is A to the target shorter or B to the target shorter? And we use this measurement, you'll see in a moment, to kind of extract the distances of the map. Of course, in this case, they choose the, the tree A. The target could have also been closer to B. And if we really mean, we'll put in quite a lot of the trials, the, the target tree roughly in the middle, making the task really hard for participants. Okay, so that's exactly what we did. We sampled the space in four different quadrants very systematically, and we'll look in those quadrants in a moment. But let's look at the reward task. In the reward task, participants in a very simple two first choice task saw two trees, made a choice, and got a reward. The cover story was magical norms giving them gold, but the idea was, was for them to just identify the most rewarding tree. So here in the center, the tree gave them 1,100 points. Around it, there was 150 points, and all the rest of the map was zero or five, but baseline. This is the point to mention that half of participants experienced the reward on the top left and half experienced in the bottom right to control for perceptual confounds, but we're gonna show the results as if all of them experienced it in the bottom right, for simplicity. So we wanted to look at what happens before and after the reward was introduced to the map. So what would think happened before? There would be some sort of a uniform representation of the environment. And as I said before, when reward is introduced, there might be an increase of representation around it. And this might come at the expense of other areas that will have a decrease of representation. Behaviorally, this will translate to increase in perceived distances in the area of the reward, and maybe even a decrease in non-rewarding area. So the first thing you can think about is that if there's increase of spacing, our task becomes easier, and that's exactly what we see. So when we compare before and after the reward, in the perceptual task where there's no reward there, participants get much better in the area of the reward. But we wanted to look a bit deeper and understand exactly how the distances are perceived. So we fitted psychophysical functions to the data. I'm gonna show it to you via a one-dimensional example, but it works on both. Where the x-axis is an objective distances or the objective coordinates and the y-axis is the psychological distance, so the perceived distances. So if we take two, like three trees, 800, 1,200, and 600, uh, 1,600 leaves, what you can imagine if participants are just counting the pixels they're looking at, we'll see this diagonal line, right? So the translation from objective to psychological is identical. But as you can imagine, like it could very much be that in higher areas of the map, so in areas where there's already a lot of items on the tree, like, like 1,200 leaves, adding 400 might not be as noticeable compared to areas, for example, with 800, where you add 400, right? So it'll be some log spacing of the space, which is also what we did, I'll show it in a second. So the idea here is that in some areas there might be a decrease of spacing, and in some areas there might be an increase of spacing, the way participants perceive it. So another way to look at it is the slope of this function. So the diagonal, we have a slope of one, but any area that has a slope above one means the space has increased, stretched, and any area that the slope is below one, that means the spacing decreased or squished. This is a lot to convey in 10 minutes, so the plan of action is get individual functions of people, look at the slope as a measurement of how the space changed. This is the point to say the space was a priori logged, but because we're looking at pre versus post, this had to make a lot of change in the analysis and the results. So that's what we did. We fitted psychophysical functions to see, okay, how participants are perceiving both dimensions in the task, in the 2D case. And we do see that participants are not counting pixels, so we have evidence that's going down when we compare pre versus post. We have evidence to show that there is a translation function, a psychophysical function, uh, that is not the diagonal. 
But how exactly does it look? Let's take this apart. So this is our map, and as I said, the reward is on the bottom right. The x-axis in everything you're going to look at is the objective space, and the y-axis is the psychological space. So if we look at what happens to the x-axis, we see the psychological function, which is hard to see in effect here. But what we can notice is that the red line notice the reward location. So you see it's at the high area, which is here. And then we can look at the slope and the slope difference before and after. And what we can see here is that in the area of the reward, the slope increased, meaning there has been a stretching of the space. In the area that's not rewarding, the slope decreased. That is a squishing of the space. And for the fruits, where the reward was in the bottom area, we see the exact opposite. So we see an increase in the reward area and a decrease in the non-rewarding area. Now, to combine those two together and show it in a bit of a better way, maybe, this is the change of slope, or if you want sensitivity, before and after. And we can see in the area of the reward an increase of, um, of slope, which means a stretching of the space, and in the non-rewarding area, we see a decrease, that is a squishing of the space. So to summarize, we've seen that experience of reward increase perceived distances in, uh, in non-physical spaces, which corresponds to a change of sensitivity in the map. And there is, we seem to have quite good evidence that non-rewarding areas might be losing sensitivity. Next up, we are collecting MRI data of this project, and we have some piloting data, and we really want to see how the underlying representation of this space changes when the coordinate system changes according to the reward location. I want to thank my collaborator, Charlie Christian, and of course, Nico, the supervisor, and I'm open to any questions. Time for a few questions. Um, Chris, do you want to take, take us away? Lovely work. So there's something you can do that other studies that have tackled this problem in one dimension can't do, and that's to ask the effect of reward on both the relevant decisions, how decisions are influenced by both the relevant and the irrelevant information. And I wonder if you've done that, and if, if, you can, if, there is a ch if the reward changes in particular the influence of the irrelevant, irrelevant dimension on choice. Uh, if the reward is irrelevant, if it will change the space, that's what you meant? In this task? In this task, both are relevant. <laughs> so maybe I'll, like, I'll, in this task, both, so yes, we did fit it separately to the axis, but the reward was dependent on both axes, so only this area was rewarding. for different participants. Um, so I think part of the reason why we flip the reward location is exactly to get this balance of axes. So when half the participants had the reward here, that's the high area of leaves and low on fruits, and half, half are the other. And then when we collapse it, and we see the effect also when we split, so we see that it's not really dependent on the axis. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for a great talk. Um, I'm just wondering, so on that heat map on the right, uh, uh, so I would have expected that the, uh, the slope is changing monotonically, but you see it's uh, increasing at, at the upper edge. And is that just... Um, uh, also, also, it's it's you know, on the on the other direction as well. Is it just an artifact of the way you're uh, you mean driving this area, this, or, or is it um is, is there something at the boundaries you think that's um happening? You mean this area? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's very interesting. So I could say that this replicates in reaction time, and I'm pretty sure yes, in reaction time I don't see this, but what I do think it is is the training effect. So this area of the map has a lot of leaves and a lot of fruit. It's very hard to know the difference, even though we logged the space it's still very hard. And I think what happens is that in the first session, they're just exposed to the map, and then they have five more hours of experience until they do the second session, and they just get much better in it, and I think that's what's happening there. Okay, so regardless of where the reward is in that square, you should see the same. Uh, uh, yes, exactly. I haven't actually split it between the two groups to see if it's there in both. Um, that's a good...
Thank you. Okay, we'll take one more question while our next speaker gets set up. Thanks, I had a similar question. So as you mentioned at the beginning, object density also biases those maps. So I wondered if exposure to different parts of the maps can also explain this effect, especially how you see it change over time. Um, Uh, yes, so um, there's two controls we did for that. First of all, the strong control, we, they were exposed to the whole map. I should have said that more clearly. They were exposed equally to the whole map, also in the reward. So also in the reward task, they saw all the trees across the whole map equally in the perception and reward. So there won't be a bias necessarily of seeing something more often. And about the density itself, we have quite a lot of control trials where the first tree has leaves and fruits but then the two trees have only leaves or only fruits. So we kind of train them to look at the two dimensions separately and process them um, and kind of trying through that to control kind of like a more holistic density approach, but rather them experiencing both dimensions. Okay, and in subjective space, so it could be that they sort of do some auto shaping, but they believe they're closer to the goal in this way sort of represent like distort space over time. Can you, sorry, why, do you, like, why would it change over time? So, so you, you can control subjectively how close they are to the reward space. Subjectively, if they think they're close or they're further away, and then they sort of, this is how this Grinch space be behind them and extrapolated in front of them. Can you look at this over time in a way? Uh, you mean over time to reward exposure? Yes, sort of in the middle of learning, at the end of learning, and... Yes, yeah, so we do want to look at... Uh, so we did sample the reward session in a way that we could still take some sort of a space measurement there. Uh, and we do hope that we could see kind of like an evolved effect there, even though it's not a perceptual task. But I can tell you that the, when I split the post session to two, I do see it slowly disappearing. Uh, I do see, or let, let's say I see a stronger effect in the first half compared to the second half after the reward session. Thanks. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Eli Ma. She's an assistant professor in the Developmental and Educational Psychology Unit at Leiden University. Um, she's gonna talk about the component processes of complex planning following distinct developmental trajectories. Yes. Thank you, Kim. Uh, can you hear me okay like this? All right. Uh, great, yeah, so this is a project that we did on the development of planning across adolescence and it's work that I did in collaboration with Camille Faneuf, Bas van Ophoeste, Wajima, and Kate Hartley. So planning is a form of model-based reasoning, and we define planning as a form, <laughs> as a form of sequential decision-making that involves the mental simulation of potential futures and their consequences. <laughs> and planning is hard. We all know that planning is a necessary skill to uh, make decisions that are beneficial in the long term and to avoid myopic decision-making. And we often need planning in our daily lives, like planning to take enough time to prepare for our CCN talks without stressing out in the last minute. A purely hypothetical example. <laughs> but people aren't born with great planning skills. Uh, there's a large developmental literature that has shown that planning improves during childhood. And it's a skill, of course, that children need to learn to develop into independent adults. So characterizing individual differences in planning skill has been a long-standing interest in developmental science. The finding that planning skill improves during childhood is robust across different studies and different types of assessments like the brief, uh, which is a questionnaire, and behavioral tasks like the Tower of London, which requires the participant to move balls across different pegs in order to reach a goal state in as few moves as possible. Now, the exact developmental pattern does vary between studies, with some find linear improvements with age, uh, whereas others find strong improvements during childhood, and some find that it extends even into late adulthood. But one consistent finding is that age differences are actually strongest when uh, planning is complex, meaning that there are a large number of future states that can be reasoned through. So one possible uh, reason for this discrepancy is that planning consists of multiple cognitive component processes that have not been distinguished in traditional assessments. And in order to do that, we would need a task that is sufficient to sufficiently rich while also having a computational model that is still tractable and allows us to distinguish between these different component processes. And fortunately for us, such a task and model exist. They were developed by Bas van Ophoesten and Weiji Ma. Uh, and they extensively tested and validated the model in adults. 
Um, so for details, I'd like to refer you to their paper. Um, the reference is here at the bottom. The task is called Four in a Row, and it's a richer variant of tic-tac-toe. So the human participant and a computer opponent alternate placing black and white tokens on a four by nine game board. And the first to connect four of their tokens in a row is the winner. So this video uh, shows, is going to show that black is going to win at the top. Um, so participants were 8 to 25 years old. They each played 35 games of these uh, um, uh, four in a row games against computer opponents, which we varied in difficulty level uh, in a staircasing algorithm to uh, approximate a two win to one loss ratio for each participant. Now, because of the board size and the combinatorics of the game, the task has a really large spa state space, and it's larger than uh, state spaces that we commonly see in cognitive science. And this has two benefits. So first of all, um, it increases the ecological validity, because people often manage to plan their actions in real-life situations where the state space is extremely large. And second, we expected that this large state space also makes the task more sensitive to age differences in planning skill. So even without using a computational model, we find that four in a row is sensitive to age differences. So here we see ELO rating as a function of age, and ELO rating is a common measure of playing strength based on game outcomes only. The higher player's ELO rating is relative to another player's, um, the larger the probability of winning against that player. And here we see that ELO rating improves with age, especially up to late adolescence. Now the computational model has two main components. There's a heuristic value function to evaluate states, and there's a forward simulation uh, component uh, to reason ahead about the consequences of moves for any number of future steps. For the evaluation function, we use features that can be completed to four in a row. These are two in a row, two in a row unconnected, three in a row, four in a row, and board centrality, as it's usually also good to play somewhere in the middle of the board as opposed to on the edges. So each of these features are subjectively weighted, and the value of a state is then given by the weighted sum of these features. Now, four in a row is an adversarial game, so players should try to maximize their own features while minimizing those of their opponents. So this value function showed us to how to evaluate any given board state. So we can also use that to reason ahead uh, about future states as well. And this is the second part of the model, the forward simulation part which is a best first search algorithm. Now the key idea here is that people are more likely to reason multiple steps ahead for promising moves than they are to do so for bad moves. So this process constructs a decision tree where we can start at a root node that could be, for example, an empty game board. We identify possible moves, take the most promising move and expand the tree from that node. So intuitively, it kind of comes down to finding your best move option then considering uh, what your opponent would do in response to that, what you would do after, and so on. So the best first search is a method that originally originated from traditional AI games, like chess computers. Uh, so here we added various mechanisms to make the model play more human-like. For example, candidate actions with a value much lower than the best were pruned. The model also makes a random move with a small probability. And tree building terminates with a stopping probability, and this can happen at every iteration, or when the best option hasn't changed in a while. The last one is feature drop rate, which is the probability of overlooking a random feature on a board. So we fit the model to individual subjects' data using maximum likelihood estimation, and the model has 10 free parameters. We then run the fitted model in generative mode on a set of test positions, and derive the metrics from the resulting decision trees. So the results of the fitted model show that people build bigger decision trees with age. Especially tree depth seemed to increase with age, meaning that people reason more steps ahead into the future. And to a lesser extent, the trees also become wider with age, meaning that with age, people also consider more altern alternative moves in each state. So heuristic quality is a measure of how good the participant's value function is. It reflects the correlation between the optimal state values and the subjective state values derived from the heuristic value function. This increased with age and stabilized in late adolescence uh, to adulthood. And finally, there's feature drop rate, which is the probability of overlooking a random feature on the board. And this did not show any age-related differences. 
So across age, we found that these metrics all contribute to playing strength, but they also showed age-related differences therein. So for children and adolescents, um, it turned out that strong players also had a higher heuristic quality, but this relationship was not significant in adults, and that's probably because our adults already had a sufficiently high heuristic quality. So instead, for adults, it turned out that tree depth was the larger, com largest contributor to ELO ratings, and this was not significant for children and adolescents. And there were no significant age group differences in the contribution of tree width to ELO ratings. This heuristic search model was also a better fit compared to a random model and a simple heuristic model without planning, and this further strengthens our confidence in the findings. So to conclude, four in a row um, allows us to study complex planning across development, and in a broader sense, it helps us understand the development of model-based reasoning that Kate also talked about in her keynote. The computational model that we use successfully characterizes the component processes of planning, and specifically we saw that development seems to first prioritize the development and the refinement of heuristic quality over decision tree expansion. And it's possible that this finding could also generalize to most complex planning problems, and might even be adaptive, because it's typically best to have a good representation of the current problem and the work predictive features therein, before it becomes worthwhile to expand all the efforts to plan very deeply ahead into the future. So our approach and model can also serve as a method for understanding uh, planning in more traditional tasks, like uh, more complex variants of the Tower of London, for example. And it would be interesting to test whether our conclusions indeed generalize to those other settings. So finally, I'd like to thank the team of co-authors, the funding agencies, and the CZN organizers for such a wonderful conference. And thank you for your attention. Uh, excellent talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to ask, have you, is there a possibility of uh, a strategy that doesn't look very good initially that, uh, you know, somebody might, if they, if you taught it to them, they would be able to win better, um, but, you know, looks bad at the first move or something like that so people don't discover it. Specifically, I'm sort of thinking in terms of the idea that, uh, you know, maybe there's some way of creating a fork situation that, uh, you know, involves things that aren't adjacent and aren't necessarily near the middle of the board and so on. Um, so, you know, does, do those situations like exist in this problem space? Uh, good question, thank you. Uh, that's an interesting point. So, um, I do think there are probably more heuristics uh, that humans could show than the ones that um, we use for the model. Um, so there is also uh, a lot of work that came out of like uh, another, uh, the whole sort of research line that came out of the, the model and the task that Boss and Weiji developed. And I know that there's one PhD student, uh, Jonathan Cooperwise in the um, Weiji's lab, who's working on using uh, neural nets as well to identify what kind of heuristics people actually use in these types of games. Um, so, if there are indeed more complex strategies like the ones that you were mentioning, then uh, I think that they might be able to find that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hey, my question was about learning this task. So, we could imagine that um, especially children just might repeat the same strategy over again if it worked, or that they try to imitate the PC if the PC won the previous round. So, do you also see that changes over time that like, like any adults might just plan ahead and they, they sort of have this offline planning, but, but children maybe just imitate what they've done before if it worked. Yeah, interesting. Um, is this on? Just yeah. Okay. Sorry? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, that's interesting. So we uh, did do a split half on the first uh, like half of the games and second half. And we didn't really find any age related differences also in like the and like differences between the two halves and also not as a function of age. Um, so I don't think we have direct evidence for that. Um, maybe it's possible to repeat strategies, but one other thing I'd like to note is that because of the large state space of the game, uh, almost every state that they saw was kind of unique. So I think um, we calculated the number of unique states and it's around like 80, uh, no, 98 percent or something like that. So, um, very model-free learning in the sense that you recognize a board state and then just 
remember that from previous experiences and just repeating the same actions there. I think that's fairly hard to do in something that shows you so many unique states. But it's an interesting question to um, investigate learning in more detail. Definitely. Thanks. <laughs> We have time for one more question. Have you thought about why uh, people get better at planning um, with age? Do you think it's like a feature or a bug? Oh, that's an interesting question. Why do people get, more, get better at planning with age? Um, so I think there are different component processes that even go into tree depth. Uh, one important one might be working memory. And we know from developmental literature that working memory also develops uh, during adolescence, for example. So I think uh, working memory is a very important component in order for you to remember uh, all these feature states and you know, what could happen in the future. So I think that might also play a role there. I don't know if that answers your question or if your question was more about the evolution of planning deeply, but... Um... Okay. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Dr. Verena Sarazin from uh, the Department of Psychiatry at Oxford. Um, she's going to talk about modulating reward and punishment learning rates in low mood using transcranial direct current stimulation. Thanks. Hello, everyone. I am very excited to present my project, Modulating Learning Rates in Low Mood Using Brain Stimulation. And you can already see from the title that we're moving into a more clinical direction now. I'm working in a brain stimulation lab, and we're particularly interested in the application of non-invasive brain stimulation in the treatment of depression. In my lab, we conduct proof of concept studies in healthy volunteers or volunteers with low mood to um, find new ways of improving brain stimulation treatment. And this talk will be an example for how we can apply computational methods in clinical research. So how does brain stimulation treatment work? So I've been working with a method called transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS. TDCS is a portable device with two electrodes, one anode and one cathode. We fix these electrodes on our participant's head and induce a very low constant electric current to their brain. The stimulation creates an electric field inside the brain, and this field can have excitatory or inhibitory effects on brain excitability. In depression treatment, we aim to excite the left dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which is hyperactive in depression. So how does the stimulation reduce depressive symptoms? Well, the left DLPFC is part of a brain network involved in emotion regulation. So when we stimulate the left DLPFC, we actually indirectly change activity um, across this whole emotion regulation network. And we believe that the antidepressant effect of TCS relies on improvements in emotion regulation. So in clinical trials, the stimulation is usually applied in daily sessions of 20 to 30 minutes over, uh, over a period of four weeks. And this treatment protocol has been found to have mild to moderate antidepressant effects. So we need to think about how we can improve the way the stimulation is applied. So how can TDCS treatment be improved? In clinical trials, TDCS is usually applied at rest. This means participants just sit in a chair and wait while their brain is being stimulated. However, we know that TDCS increases plasticity in learning. So on a physiological level, TDCS increases postsynaptic potential, similar to long-term potentiation, which is associated with neuroplasticity. And on a behavioral level, TDCS increases learning effects. So we think we should take advantage of these effects on neuroplasticity and learning and combine the stimulation with a learning task. So we think that TDCS uh, applied during the performance of a learning task might be more effective than applying TDCS at rest. So during my PhD, I conducted a study in uh, participants suffering from low mood to test what effect TDCS has if we apply it during the, during the performance of a reinforcement learning task. We've chosen reinforcement learning because depression is associated with deficits in reward and punishment learning, and these deficits are actually hypothesized to cause and maintain depressive symptoms. So I'm going to start by explaining the task, and then we move on to the study design. So the task we've been using is called Information Bias Learning Task, and this task manipulates the relative informativeness of win and loss outcomes. So on every trial, there are two shapes that are presented on a screen. Participants make a choice, and then a win and a loss outcome appear on the screen. Um, the wins and losses are independently associated with the shapes. So each trial can lead to one out of four different scenarios. 
So the participant might get the win and win 10 pence. The participant might get the loss and lose 10 pence. The participant might get both outcomes in which they cancel out, or the participant might get neither of the outcomes. So you can see wins and losses are completely independent of one another, and the study design allows us to manipulate the relative informativeness of wins and losses. So in one condition, wins um, show a strong volatile association with the, with, the, with the shapes, and the losses are randomly associated with the shapes. So here, wins are more informative than losses. Then we have one condition where the pattern is reversed. Losses show a volatile association with the shapes, and wins are randomly associated with the shapes. So here, losses are more informative than wins. So you can see uh, we have one condition where wins are more informative and one condition where losses are more informative, and we expect participants to adjust their behavior to this. So participants should update their beliefs faster according to the more informative outcome, so we should see higher learning rates for the more informative outcome. So uh, the model uh, we fitted to the data is the Reskola wagner model with separate learning rates for wins and losses. So the model estimates the win probability and the loss probability of the shapes. And uh, you can see that those are updated with a win learning rate and a loss learning rate. And importantly, win and loss learning rates are independent of one another. And these two um, estimated probabilities are then combined in a softmax function. What we're particularly interested in in this project are the win and the loss learning rate parameter. So here is the study design. Um, we recruited a sample of participants suffering from Le Mute. Half of these participants received TDCS during the performance of this task, so that's a condition of interest, and half of the participants received TDCS before task performance at rest. So remember, we're trying to test whether stimulating during the task has a different effect than stimulating before the task at rest. All participants received TDCS through the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, and they all came in for two sessions. In one session, they received real TDCS, in the other session, sham TDCS. And then we started by asking, what effect does low mood have on task performance? So we compared performance between these participants with low mood to a sample of healthy participants from our previous study, and here we used the sham TDCS condition. So that's uh, task performance without any influence of brain stimulation. And we then uh, tested what effect TDCS had uh, on task performance in these participants with low mood, and we were particularly interested in comparing the effects of TDCS applied during versus before task performance. So let's look at the effect of low mood on reward learning. So I've plotted the win and loss learning rates for the condition where losses are more informative and the condition where wins are more informative. And um, what you can see is there's no uh, difference between participants with low mood and healthy participants. Um, so there's some previous research that indicates uh, depression might be associated with increased punishment learning, but we did not observe this in our study. However, we found that low mood had an effect on learning rate adjustment. So remember, we expect participants to adjust their win and loss learning rates to the different um, conditions. And healthy people are very good at doing this. So I've plotted a measure which is called learning rate adjustment bias. This is the extent of how much people adjust their loss learning rates compared to how much they adjust their win learning rates to informativeness. And you can see that healthy people have a measure around zero. So they adjust their loss learning rates to the same extent as their win learning rates. Individuals suffering from low mood have a negative value in this measure. This means they adjust their loss learning rate less than their win learning rates to changes in informativeness, or in other words, they struggle to adjust their loss learning rates. And this is in line with previous research. So now let's look at the effect of TDCS applied during task performance. If we just look at learning rates per se, there was no effect of TDCS, but TDCS had an effect on this learning rate adjustment measure that we uh, looked at on the previous slide. So during sham TDCS, uh, individuals with low mood adjust their, their loss learning rate less than the win learning rate, and during real TDCS, uh, they adjust their loss learning rate to the same extent uh, than, the, than the win learning rate, so that's the same pattern as we see in healthy people. So we can say TDCS normalized learning rate adjustment in individu individuals with low mood. So that was TDCS. TDCS applied during task performance. Um, let's look at the effect of TDCS applied before task performance at rest. And here we can see that there was no effect of TDCS at all, um, so neither on learning rates nor learning rate adjustment. So the effect of TDCS was specific to the time part of stimulation we only saw when it stimulated during task performance. Okay. So um, to sum up, um, low mood was associated with impaired adjustment of loss learning rates, and TDCS normalized this, but only if applied during task performance. 
So here I should mention that we used two different computational models to analyze the data. In one model, we found the results that I just presented. In the other model, we didn't find any effect of uh, TDCS. So we're not 100% sure why these different models come to different conclusions. Having said that, we've also uh, conducted some non-computational uh, analyses um, to find measures that capture something similar, and these uh, analyses confirm the effect of TDCS that I presented here. From a clinical perspective, um, the question is, is there a causal relationship between learning rate adjustment and uh, mood? So it sounds promising that TDCS normalizes learning rate adjustment, but uh, it's currently unclear whether this would also help to improve mood, and uh, we plan to test this in future studies. And then for the brain stimulation community, um, it's very interesting to see that the effect was specific to the time point of stimulation, and we think TDCS might actually be more effective if we applied during a learning task, so we think it might actually be worth um, running clinical trials and see whether um, using this combined treatment of stimulation and task repeatedly, if this has stronger antidepressant effects than applying TDCS at rest. Okay. Uh, with this, I would like to thank my collaborators. I hope this was an interesting example for how we can apply computational methods in clinical research. And thank you for your attention. Thanks so much for that wonderful talk. Um, we have time for a few questions. Hi, thank you. This was really, really great. I was curious if we, if we call it the red task and the green task. So participant needs to do two tasks at the same time. And if we don't think for a moment on the, just for a moment on the win and loss, there is a case in which the red task is telling you right and the green task left. Yes. And there is a moment where they agree. And I wonder if you saw some sort of a congruency effect in that sense of either reaction time or accuracy when participants, um, when both told, like, maybe dynamically both told them to choose the same or differently, and then if maybe there, there is a bias to one of them, and then we go to loss and reward, maybe there is a bias to choose more by the red task for depressed people, because they're more, inf like more influenced by the loss. Yeah, that's a really good observation. So this is one, uh, one measure we've looked at that I didn't uh, present today. But uh, there are trials where um, wins and losses tell you something different, right? If they're presented with the same shape, you can choose. Do I want to avoid the loss or do I want to get the win? And um, um, so in this study, we didn't find a difference, actually. So you might expect that maybe depressed people try to avoid the losses more than they try to get the wins. We didn't see that uh, in the study, but it was one of the measures we looked at. Yeah, very Thanks good so question. Much. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting to see. Um, so the subjects you had were low mood. Were they diagnosed with major depressive disorder and were they on medication? That's yeah. So uh, low mood was defined as a cutoff on a depression questionnaire. So it was uh, 10 or above on the BDI. Um, however, the range uh, we observed was like very broad. So um, some participants would definitely meet the criteria for major depressive episode. Um, but yeah, there was quite a wide range of... And were they on medication? Um, no, they were not on medication. And this is because uh, we, we're not allowed to apply TDCS if someone takes any kind of medication. Ah, okay. So, so is it known if there's any interaction effect between meds being on board and TDCS? Um, so there might be an interaction between medication and TDCS. What uh, we're worried about is the risk of inducing seizures. So normally TDCS doesn't, uh, doesn't induce seizures, um, but there might be an interaction between medication and stimulation. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Our last speaker of the session is Dr. Frederica Pechna, who's an assistant professor at Brown University. She's gonna talk about the illusion of control and how it differentially affects outcome predictions in pathological and recreational gamblers. Thank you. Hi, um, thank you for having me. I know it's the last talk, so I'll make it hopefully a bit more entertaining for everybody involved. Um, my lab is called the Psychiatry, Embodiment, and Computation Lab, so we study brain world and brain body interactions um, using computational models. And today I want to talk a little bit about the illusion of control, but really also how it relates to learning. So in order to get started, I just want to have you look at this for a few seconds and think what um, could be displayed here in that data set. Pretty much looks like spike data, but then you realize the time scales are off and it says days, right? Turns out that's something completely different. This is actually the smartphone use of a 14-year-old plotted over time 
What you see here is the different categories. So orange is social media use. The reason I'm showing this is because a new study just showed that on average, teenagers spend about eight hours in front of a screen just for entertainment and purposes a day. That's a long time where most of the time is spent using social media and scrolling. So it's a very simple action, but a fairly entertaining stimulus that is being used, and we are happy to engage in this for hours. Turns out this is not new. We've seen this before, and we've seen it in a different context, namely in gambling a lot. Um, the most addictive device currently that's out there are slot machines. They have the same thing, very nice visual stimulus, fairly simple behavioral patterns that we're willing to engage in. Turns out, for players who play for many hours in front of a slot machine, the casino has developed its own name. They call it TOTS, and TOTS stands for Time on Device Player. So really, there's a category of people who really want to spend a lot of time in front of a device. So what I was very interested in is trying to understand why it is that we do get hooked and why some people actually stay hooked in the sense that they become addicted. And uh, you could say, well, that's a very simple answer to that question, which is um, it's intermittent reinforcement. And we know that since the 60s and since Skinner, that if we reinforce a behavior, not all the time, but in an unpredictable schedule, we'll get the strongest reinforcing effects. So somehow, intermittent reinforcement lays in this sweet spot between frustration, where we're never rewarded, and if you want so, boredom, where you're always rewarded. Um, but the key question, though, is when do we ever encounter intermittent reinforcement in real life? And there are some scenarios where we do. One example where I think we do encounter this is when we learn a new skill. So at the beginning, when you're learning how to ride a bicycle, you make a lot of mistakes, but after a while, you're getting rewarded more and more, and actually, it's a learning signal that tells you how to perform. But interesting enough, it is also a signal that's associated with control, because as control increases, you should be getting more rewards. And after a while, we actually stop learning, and it's usually when we stop making mistakes, and that's why, even though most of us have been biking for more than 20 years, None of us are mountain bike professionals because we no longer put ourselves in an environment where we continue to learn. So now back to slot machines. Here you have a random intermittent reinforcement schedule. There's nothing to learn. Yet the key question remains, is it that we're actually still learning in those environments and are we more prone to developing beliefs about control, even if there is none? And so one of the things that we've been trying to measure here is basically building our own slot machine. Um, where we measured both pathological and recreational gamblers. Pathological gamblers meant these are individuals who are diagnosed with a gambling addiction, um, and they're starting treatment right after they did this task. And then there's a group of recreational gamblers who just play for fun, but they go to the casino. And they were actually very hard to recruit, um, to find people who are not addicted and are gambling. So this is our slot machine. It works um, like most slot machines. There are three wheels in the middle. You have to place a bet first. If you get three identical symbols, that means you get a multiplier of your bet size back. In that case, you had um, three sevens, so that would mean you get 10 times your bet size back. Um, if you had three oranges, it would have meant that you get two times your bet size back. The part that is um, different is this part on the very um, left, from my perspective, um, which is a guess game. So what we ask people to do is not only bet, but also tell us what they think is going to happen next on the particular trial, if they're going to lose or how much they're going to win on every given trial. What we also do is we switch people between machines, and they don't know the, what the differences between the machines are, but I'm going to tell you in a little bit. Um, but just to remind you, so this basically every single trial consists of um, three stages. The first one is you have to predict an outcome, or you predict the reward. The second one is you're placing a bet, and then you can have a win, loss, or a new miss. And the last one is actually when you win, we also allow you to engage in a risky gamble where you can double your win or nothing. That's a very typical feature in the casino. So what participants don't know is that we actually have four different machines, and they follow a two-by-two two factorial design. So the first type of machine, basically in the upper corner here, I don't see my pointer, so I'm going to do it this way, um, basically gives you payouts that are fairly small. So you get two or three times your bet size back whenever you're winning. The other set of machines with high reward magnitude actually would give you six to eight times your bet size back, so it's the reward magnitude that is different. But the winning probability on all of those machines is actually constant, so we're only manipulating reward magnitude. Then we take the same set of machines with the exact same outcome trace, no differences between the machines in the upper row and the machines in the lower row. The only difference that you can see here is we add stop buttons under every single wheel. You can press the button, and what it's going to do is it's going to stop the wheel. The outcome is pre-programmed, so it's a pure illusion of control. You have an effect on the output, but you have no effect on the outcome. That's important. Make sense so far? Okay. 
If you look how people gamble in this game, um, the first thing that you see is um, there's a huge difference between pathologic and recreational gamblers. This is on logarithmic scales. So gamblers um, who are addicted obviously bet a lot more. But if you look at that in terms of button presses, it's actually quite interesting. Every time you're increasing um, the bet, you have to press the button once. And we had several individuals who would press the button per trial 50 times. So at the beginning, they would use the thumb. At the end, they would actually use the palm of the hand to keep increasing the bet size. So in terms of behavior, that was quite striking. And that's also why we wondered if it relates to anything that you see in real life. And it, it turns out that the bet behavior in this game, so how much you're willing to bet in the game, um, strongly relates to symptom severity in real life in terms of gambling disorder. So it, the idea here is it's a symptom-provoking um, paradigm. More interesting question is the illusion of control. How does it affect bad behavior? And it turns out in both groups, so in blue you see the recreational gamblers, and basically every time it says C+, plus, it means control is high. Or in other words, the machine has stop buttons, then they actually tend to bet more, both the recreational gamblers and the pathological gamblers. Again, the trace of those machines compared to the other ones is completely identical. It's just the presence of stop buttons. Even more interesting, it doesn't correlate with whether you use the stop buttons or not. So the mere fact that there is a stop button actually leads to an increase in bet sizes. Um, the effect is as strong as this effect of the reward magnitude manipulation, so that was also surprising to us. That really seems like if you're in a context of control, um, it really seems to be shifting um, the scenario in the sense that you would feel that you're getting a higher rewards, and we get into how we could interpret that in a second. That's specifically true when the environment is lean and we can get into a lot of additional effects that I'm not going to talk about here, but I think that's also a particularly interesting case, is, is that when you're in a low reward environment, we're more prone to that illusion. So the key question now is how would you think about this in a computational manner? How does that actually influence bad behavior if we have an illusion of control? If you think of a, one simple definition of control could be, I have an impact on the outcome, so the probability of an outcome given my own action. And then the illusion of control would be my subjective belief about whether my, my actions are actually affecting outcomes in the environment. Or you could rephrase it for this game and say, whenever you think you're in control, you should be more likely to win. And so what we did before is we asked them about their subjective odds so we can actually see if your subjective odds in the environment have changed just as a function of having these stop buttons on the, mach on the machine. Um, again, what you see is pathological gamblers are much more optimistic about outcomes that they're observing in the world. So what you see here is how much they predict they will be getting on average on the next trial. But the more interesting aspect is shown here. So everything that's in light green means um, a context in which they are in a low control environment, so the machine has no stop buttons. And then you see the pink shift, basically, which means that suddenly they are in a high control environment. One of the things you can observe, I oh, now I see my pointer, um, is that it almost becomes bimodal. So there's a subset of individuals who really shift their outcome expectations to thinking that they are much more likely to win high in particular. And you see that shift both in recreational and in pathological gamblers. So really it seems that control seems to be shifting your expected odds. So if that's the case, then the question is, can we, how does it explain that you're betting more? Does that mean it's actually changing the value of the environment you're in? And uh, one way that you can look at this is thinking about expected values, where it's not only about the reward that you're getting on every single trial, but it's actually also depending on how likely is it that I'm going to get a reward. So where the illusion of control could come in is by changing the probability of receiving a reward in your environment. And so that's one way you could integrate that into a model. And so what we did next is try to explain single trial behavior across participants with a set of models the first set of models assumes you're not learning anything because it's a random environment, there's nothing to learn. So basically, you could just have a constant bet. That's the first model. Or you can assume, well, you're basically reactive. Every time you're winning, you should bet more. If you're losing, you bet less. But you're basically just responding to the previous reward. You're still not learning. The alternative to that could be that you're learning, but what you're learning is something about the machine you're playing on. So you basically develop a value of the context, which means that some high payout machines you should bet higher, on low payout machines you should bet lower. Um, there's different ways. You could either assume that you have one learning weight or you have two different learning weights, depending on whether they have positive and negative prediction errors. Um, and the first version, though, is a version where you say, yes, I'm learning about the value of the machine, but also there's an increase every time I have a signal of control. And so in this case, every time there's a stop button and there's actually another feature of control 
don't have much time to go into here, um, which is near misses, but they have the exact same effects, and I can show you some data on that as well. Um, basically, in these cases, you would see an increase, a relative increase in value every time there is a control signal. So we fit those models to individual subjects' behaviors, um, and it doesn't matter which um, comparison you use, if you use AIC, BIC, or here. In this case, I'm going to show you a um, variational Bayesian um, comparison, but basically it's always this last model that is um, outperforming all of the other ones. So really what it suggests is that even we're in this completely random environment, individuals are learning, and they're strongly influenced in their value assessments based on um, whether they have control or not. Um, it could be a terrible model out of many terrible models, so you also have to see if it's actually replicating the main effects you see in the behavior. Um, and we both see it, the reward effect, the control effect, and also on a single subject level that it really seems to be capturing something that participants are doing. Okay, so to run this, uh, sum this up, um, I originally said that um, we are usually living in environments where intermittent reinforcement is tied to skill learning and tied to control. Um, but here we basically used a completely random environment and we induced an illusion of control just by giving people stop buttons that didn't do anything. And the idea is that this illusion of control led to higher subjective probabilities of winning, which we then used to increase the expected value of the environment. Um, and if we now think about what we started off with, it is quite unnatural to be in environments that are constantly intermittently reinforcing you without you having any control about that environment. And so now we are more and more living in societies where we have algorithms that actually learn how to prevent or predict which reward schedule is optimal for us, specifically when you're looking about social and into social media use. So I think it's quite interesting to try to understand why this can be a very maladaptive thing if we're hijacking a skill learning mechanism. Um, with that, I want to thank everybody who's been involved in this study. It was conducted both at the ETH and University of Zurich and at Brown University. And I also want to mention that I'm hiring, I'm looking for a postdoc. We're not just doing modeling of um, task-based data, but we also just developed an app um, where we try to get momentary assessments over many days um, over the course of an individual's lives to try to use RL, but this time for real-life interactions and not just for task-based interactions. So if you're interested in that, um, come to me or come to one of my two students who are both here, Sienna and Ellen, and ask them more about what we do. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've got time for a few questions. Uh, thanks, Vika. That was really cool. Um, so as, as I was understanding, the control in your model or your winning model is, is essentially just a, a, a constant gain on the uh, Relative final... Relative increase in value. Sorry? Relative increase. In, sorry. Relative value increase, yeah. And uh, does that... Uh, outperform or can you can compare it against models where the effect of control is on uh, cross trial learning rather than on valuation? Um, I haven't... Relative, I, I guess I was thinking like relative uh, learning for wins over losses, win outcomes over losses. If you have a different learning rate for wins over losses, that's in there already. Or yeah, but, but if, you, if you have an additional oh, I see. boost for that. Oh, actually I haven't tested if um, that would be differential for wins and losses. So you could have differential effects actually. I was even thinking, because um, you see interaction effects, that some of these effects of control are particularly prone in lean environments. Um, so I wonder if there is a way to integrate kind of the value. Right now it's relative, so it might make sense that you can exactly see that effect in our data. But I think there's different ways of actually integrating control. We haven't tried all of them yet. Hi. I had two uh, questions. The first one's just, what did you tell the subjects about the stop button? Um, we basically just told them it's going to stop the wheel. Uh huh. And uh, so presumably they thought it would. And you said that it didn't matter whether they pressed yeah. or not. It just increased. But is that an individual difference variable or a trial by trial variable that you looked at in the? whether they pressed or not. Course. It's a trial by trial. So in every single trial, we, I actually looked at if you pressed one button, two or three, or any, and it really, like, it, no impact. Uh -huh. It's quite interesting. So, and um, it, that makes me think that it's more whether there is control in the environment, and there's a couple of other sets in the data that kind of point towards more believing you're in control of your environment. So one example that I didn't show is, at the end you have this double up option. Yeah. It's a risky choice. Mm. There's no difference between pathological and recreational gamblers, but when there is control, they risk more. 
and it's completely independent. They know it's a 50-50 game. Probabilities haven't changed, yet you're risking more in environments where you have that sense of control. Uh -huh. And another manipulation that I haven't showed yet is that we actually look at near misses, where you have two symbols that are identical and the last one is different. And it turns out the near miss, is, you know, it's basically similar to a skill learning effect where it tells you you almost got a win. And after that, you see the same thing. You see a change in outcome predictions. You see a change in bad behavior. So that's actually something we integrated in the model. So there's many forms of illusions of control in the game already mm. that people seem to use that are influencing how they behave. Uh, I was interested, though, if there were some people who you know, were much more likely to press the button at all as opposed to... You know, so the between subjects probability yeah. of button press rather than the... I couldn't tell you with button presses, but I see this control parameter relates to your desirability of control. So we have a questionnaire that we ask them, how much control do you want to have in your life in general? <laughs> and it turns out it relates to that. So there is a certain amount of agency that we all have different biases for how much agency we want in life, I guess. Uh -huh. um, that seems to be reflected in whether you're, you know, you're using control. Yeah. Interesting, thank you. We'll take one last question. Uh, hi, great talk. Uh, my question is, did you uh, probe subjective probability, uh, probability judgments from people? Because it's 50-50. Uh, my theory would be that people might be attributing the volatility in environment to the control cause, like illusion of control. So the probability judgments might be skewed. Yes, um, so for the 50-50, interestingly enough, we have a debriefing questionnaire that I haven't analyzed yet where we asked them about the probability of the second game, but I couldn't tell you yet. Um, for the other one, because we asked them about the outcome predictions, one of the things that you could look at is how distorted is your report of the probability distribution as opposed to the true underlying distribution of rewards, right? And so I actually calculated a KL divergence between um, kind of what you're expecting the distribution of outcomes is as opposed to what the true outcome distribution is. What you see is that pathological gamblers have much more distorted probability distributions than recreational gamblers, and it's specifically driven because they think the probability of high rewards, like basically jackpots are 10 times your bet size, is higher. That's what's driving the effect, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, please. So that concludes the morning session of talks. Um, now we have uh, lunch, including the diversity lunch, and we'll meet back here at 1.30 for the next round of talks. Fantastic. Oh, and thank you to the wonderful speakers. Ever. <laughs>